Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear QA podcast number 197. <laughs> We're getting closer to 200. Getting close, right there. Uh, before we get started, of course, if you're new to this uh, live broadcast, if you're talking to me or you want to ask me a question or talk, start a subject, you can put a question mark first. That way I know you're talking to me. Otherwise, please feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Uh, if you're watching the rebroadcast, I timestamp uh, the uh, the things that are in the, the subject matter, whether it be the questions or the subjects we talk about. Usually, whatever subject we talk about the longest usually becomes the title of the video. And then also, if you're listening, as always, uh, to the podcast uh, on Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, SoundCloud, you name it. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. And a new feature, if you guys, uh, for those of you that watch this show on YouTube, don't know I changed things, but on the podcast, it changed a few weeks ago. And um, I don't know if anyone even noticed. <laughs> I was thinking like when I did this, I was waiting for somebody to say, why did you change it on the podcast version of this uh, live show? It's edited now. The new ones are edited. Uh, the editing is not taking away any subject matter. Nothing's removed from them. There's just little cuts and edits whenever I'm looking for questions and there's quiet or there's things like that. And of course, if you hear the chime, which is probably a good thing to say this because I don't think I've explained it. Yet, you hear a chime. Uh, it's me uh, adding to the podcast. So sometimes when I'm editing, I'll say something and then I'll, I'll chime in and add some more to it. So I have more to add to the subject. I've been adding it on the podcast. So there you go. A little, little fun fact for you guys or a little information for you. Um, okay. We have a lot of questions, a lot of subjects to already talk about and start talking about. One thing I have to tell you guys up front is that today the show has to end at exactly two hours or before because I have an interview. Uh, I'm going to be, I got to go. I got a phone interview. So, uh, there you go. Sounds like I'm applying for a job. I'm applying for a job, everyone. <laughs> no, I'm not applying for a job. It's an interview for a, um, uh, for an article or something. Something's going on. So I'll find out when I, when I do a phone call. Okay, now let's get into the subject matter as always. Um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I got smart today. I opened up the uh, the podcast and uh, what I've been doing is copy pasting uh, the first couple questions of the show. And this time I go, I opened it with my phone and I thought I'll screen grab it on my phone. That way I can see the first questions and uh, I'll look on the phone today and I'll, I'll read the first couple questions. Uh, so I apologize to everybody. I usually try to answer the first questions that were posted before the show started. However, um, uh, my, a couple hours before my, the show started, I gave my phone to my wife to program to my new phone and I guess the new phone there's an issue. So I have no phone. <laughs> so I have no way to read the first questions of the show today. So I can't read the first questions. So we're just going to randomly grab some questions, probably some super chats as well, and see where, see where the today's subject talks uh, takes us. Um, all right, let's see where we go with this. Um, you know what? Let's go over here and we'll start the ball rolling somehow. Okay. Where are we going to start with? We're going to start with Martin. Martin Leahy. Hey, Martin. Martin's a patron. Thank you, Martin, for being a patron and for the super chat today. It says, hey, Phil, should I float my current bridge or put a Vega trim on my new Jeff Beck signature Stratocaster? Your thoughts, please. Um, I I love the Jeff Beck Strat. The bridge that's in the Jeff Beck Strat is my personal favorite maybe second favorite now of the fender bridges. And the reason I say it, it, either way, it's pretty much the favorite. So the bridge that's on your Jeff back, which is a push in tremolo arm uh, block saddle bridge is the same bridge that I had put on my custom uh, fender Stratocaster. It's also on one of my standard Stratocasters. I don't know what it is, but I like the new uh, American professional series uh, trim. What's got the bent saddles and the new push in tremolo arm with the old school plastic tip. I like that one a little better, just a little maybe for feel of the of the arm. But what I'm trying to get to is I like the way the Jeff Beck bridge is. I like that bridge as much as I like the Vega trim. And I, I love that. And I can recommend that all day long. I don't know if I would change it out. Um, not to float it. To float the bridge on a, on a Strat is a very simple thing. Basically, 
Without showing you, I could tell you it's that easy. Uh, what you all you want to do is take a, a piece of cardboard or a pack of strings, you know, without the obviously the strings in some kind of packaging, and um, basically shove it underneath the bridge. So if this is the bridge, just shove something off the bridge that's going to give you about a millimeter thickness. Not very much. You don't need much. Just something underneath the bridge there to float it. Maybe a little bit more. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, the bridge is pushing down on that material. Go ahead, tune up the bridge. Okay just so it's in tune. Once it's in tune, strum it. Don't take the plastic out or the packaging off. Then what all you do is you go behind the bridge to the two, two screws on the claw and slowly turn them counterclockwise each way. So you're loosening them and let that just a little increment and then strum the guitar, make sure it's still in tune. And what you're trying to do is find the spot where you keep doing, and then all of a sudden you'll feel the guitar go a little flat because now the bridge is bending up. Go ahead and tighten them back. And all you're doing, if it makes sense to you, is all we're trying to do is get the bridge to basically want to stay where that piece of packaging or that cardboard and stuff is all by its own. And then just pull that packaging out. You'll feel it because all of a sudden it'll still be in tune and that stuff will slide out and now your bridge is floating. All floating a bridge is, is equalizing the tension of the springs and the strings themselves so that you get this perfect kind of pivot point, or fulcrum point. So that's all you want to do. It's that easy. Probably be better with the better aids, visual aids, but for a live, you know, kind of talk show thing, this is the best way I got to do it. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, they make spacers and stuff for that. You can do that. You can measure that stuff, but I mean, you'll, you'll be fine. Like I said, I would just use a package of Diodario card, just some cardboard, like I said, just about a millimeter, doesn't matter, you know, and you can be a little loose on the, on the, uh, spacing a millimeter and a half, whatever, shove something underneath there and do it. You'll get a light tremolo action. Most of my strats are. Half my strats, 50-50, so you know, 50% of them are floating, 50% are not. It has all to do with how well they float. Some strats float and stay in tune, and they're just perfect, and some are a little bitchy, and so you gotta, I just block them at that point. Okay, next question is from the panda. The panda says, I tried to woo my wife for Valentine's Day with a song. Okay, that's cool. Smart move. Hopefully, she will warm up to getting more gear. Depends on how much she liked that song. Uh, that puts the pressure on. I would imagine if you did a good job, <laughs> you can um, you can get more gear. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, when I was a, uh, a teenager still, late teens, early 20s, um, I played a show once and uh, in, with my band, and the other guitar player was a lot louder than me. And after the show, my um my uh, mother asked me she was there my mom's cool she my mom went to the show because that's actually was cool and um she said to a metal show which is even, even funnier she said why was the why was it hard to hear you sometimes and i said oh his amp's louder than mine and so sometimes he's and so she bought me a louder amp so well she helped me buy the letter louder amp that week so sometimes performing in front of people you love could help your gear situation is what i'm saying that's basically what i'm trying to say because I don't think she would have ever, ever in a million years go, you need a louder amp. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, what else do we got? Let's see. We have... Um, hold on. I'm looking for question marks first just to see what you guys are talking about. And... Okay, so Greg's question. Let's see what he's got to say. Greg says, bought a pedal from Sweetwater when you were showing their pedals online. Oh, okay. And they are still waiting for product. I wonder how many you sold of them. I sold a lot of them. Uh, I'm very aware of that. Um, that, the stuff you kind of see. Now, think about this. They they had already started just to drop the price like the day before. So they were already selling uh, pedals. I say that we sold a lot of them. Here's why. In that video, Greg, of that live show, if you remember, I said, oh, I should buy one now. Remember, I said, like, oh, I'll buy one and then I'll review it. I should buy it now. And I go, nah, I'll buy it as soon as this show's over. And I did. I bought mine. I bought, um, uh, I think, six. Here, I'll tell you guys. I don't even have to guess. I can pull up my Sweetwater account and see what I ordered. Now, I don't think they've charged me for these. They might have. I don't remember. I don't know how it works. Um, my account. Order history. Your account. Order history. Order history. I bought stuff since then. So 
This is the most exciting live show ever. What did Phil buy at Sweetwater? Okay, view PDF. Let's see if this is it. I think this is it because it's, yeah. So here's what I bought. I bought the VD400 Behringer Vintage Delay. I won't name the things. I'll just say what I bought. Behringer Vintage Delay Pedal, Vintage Tube OD Pedal, Graphic Equalizer Pedal, Digital Reverb Pedal, Compressor Sustainer Pedal, Ultra Tremolo Pedal. Those are the one, how many buy? One, two, three, four, five, six. I bought six Behringer pedals that day. Came to a huge $133.66 with uh, with tax. Shipping and handling was 13 bucks. Oh no, shipping and handling was removed. Okay, tax was nine ninety nine sixty six. Um, yeah, they haven't shipped mine either. Uh, my understanding is that they're out of stock. They don't have any. These things come from China and uh, you know, there's a term, it's called a slow boat from China. That's where that's our pedals are. <laughs> so, uh, so Greg, I understand your pain. Yes, I literally said, "Hey, let's buy some pedals. I'll buy some too." And then I, I was actually so late, I didn't get any. So yeah, but we'll get some soon. I think I talked to uh, talked to via email my Sweetwater uh, rep, and he said um, uh, he doesn't know when they're coming. That's what he told me. I heard other stories from other you guys too. Viewers said I talked. They talked to their Sweetwater reps. My rep said he has no idea when they're coming. So it could be a month. So we'll see. There you go. Yes, that's the good and the bad of mentioning products for a company. It's a, uh, it's uh, good for them. They sold some stuff. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. Um, okay, uh, let's look at the next one. Uh, the the m -m man, the m, -m man. It's this what it says. M -m -m -m, capital M, small m, man. The m -m -m man. The Mumma Man says, do you still have the Sterling St. Vincent guitar? I don't. That guitar was sold to a a, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, and he really wanted it. So I sold it. <laughs> so that's how it goes. Um, and I had convinced myself, that because I liked it so much, that I need a U.S.-made one. <laughs> and then after I sold it, I think something happened. I bought something else and uh, it just didn't work out. Okay. What else? That's how it works sometimes. My problem with the YouTube channel and my personal life being personal, being I love guitars and I like talking about guitars and then the YouTube channel being about guitars. Sometimes I sell something because I want to do something on the channel and it's just an opportunity. And sometimes I sell something, you know what I mean, for my personal thing because I want it that St. Vincent I bought, the St. Vincent I bought, uh, Sterling, I bought personally. I don't know. It's, I bought that, shared it with you guys on a show. We talked about it. I did a review of it, but of course, you know, I review stuff that I also buy too from time to time. And, um, and I recall, if I remember correctly, I don't remember why I sold it to him other than he wanted it. But I remember we did something with the money for the channel, especially at that point in the channel when I was buying a lot of like these kind of expensive microphones and stands and and stuff. I had to buy all this stuff for the channel. So a lot of times I, I kind of curtailed a little of my personal guitar purchasing for a while to buy more stuff for the YouTube stuff. Roberto, Roberto wants to know, do I have an opinion on Dean Zielinski guitars? Uh, it's like the Z glide system. I'm sure is what you're kind of getting at. Um, I've, I've worked on a bunch of Z glide guitars. They reached out to me as a f typical, very common. I have a very, very typical situation with companies. It goes like this. Hey, Phil, we like your channel. We'd like to send you a guitar. And then I go, great. And then I never hear from him again. And that would be Dean Guitars. Uh, they reached out because really what happens is I'm sure, I'm guessing, I don't know, uh, with companies, they send that out to like, uh, it's like probably 20 or to 50 YouTube channels. Hey, we love your channel. We watch your content every day. It's really a common one. Um, so, you know, all YouTube channels that I've interacted with, we all talk about the fact that they, half the time, they don't even have, they don't, like, they'll say the wrong things to you. That's how you know they're not really even paying attention. Like, I'll get it, like, Phil, we really love your online guitar lessons, and we'd like to work with you. Cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they'll go to some channel that does online guitar lessons, and they're like, we really love how you diagnose gear. <laughs> And you're like, well, obviously they didn't watch your channel. They're just, you know, sending out. So with Dean Zielinski Guitars, they reached out. Um, I think the offer I gave them was I went through their website. I picked out two guitars I thought were really cool. I said, could you send me these two guitars? And then basically I said, it would be really nice if either A, I get to keep one of the ones like out of the two I like, maybe keep it and continue to promote it and talk about it on the channel after we do the reviews of those two. So two separate videos, you guys would get to two, review two guitars or two videos and uh, you get two videos. 
maybe I keep one or maybe I get a discount on one. You know what I mean? Depends, you know, because at first I got to find out if I even really want one, right? If I don't want one, it doesn't matter. I'll just do two videos and they get it back. Really wins for them in that case. And uh, I got ghosted, as they would say. They just never heard back from them. I think I followed up with them once and never heard again. It happens a lot. It's very common. I spend about two hours, no exaggeration, a week, two hours, and I'm being nice. My wife will say probably 10 hours a week. I spend two hours a week talking to companies, just basically wasting my time. So, and I used to not talk about with that you, with you guys. I used to leave that off the off the, the show and off the stuff. But at this point, you know, I've gotten to the point now where they either will send you something and you can do a review and help them out, you know, because it helps them more than me always. My my ten thousand views I got on something makes me thirty one dollars to their, you know, they'll sell ten guitars. They'll come out ahead every time. So, I love doing it. I love putting my hands on stuff. And the biggest advantage to me sometimes is I get to touch something that I normally wouldn't buy and maybe, you know, not only share it with you guys, but also get this kind of like, oh, get it out of my system. Like, okay, maybe I don't need this. I've had that happen a couple of times now where I review, review guitars. And although I love the guitars, you know, they got sent back to the companies. Um, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, um, what do you call it? I don't think anybody here is confused by that, right? Like if a company sends me a guitar for any reason and it goes back to the company, it's not just the company wants the guitar back. I didn't find enough about it to buy it. I can't own everything. That'd be just crazy. But obviously if I didn't, you know, because I can tell you I have guitars. Uh, there's a couple, there, in fact, I won't tell you just to keep it kind of fun. There's a couple guitars behind me right now that were sent to me for a loan and then I reached out to the company. And I said, I don't want to send it back. Can I buy it, please? What, what's my price? You know, what can we do? And uh, and there you go. And I won't uh, I won't tell a company I will buy a guitar unless I really, really want it. So I that, hope that was insightful <laughs> or not. Um, this is an impossible question to ask or, or answer. It's an easy question to ask. It's an impossible one to answer. David wants to know, hey, David, he says, are we in the golden age of guitars, a golden guitar age? And um, I, I would have to understand the reference of that, you know, is the golden, sometimes the golden age of something means the best of it, right? So that's what I'm, I'm just clarifying. I'm interpreting your question, is this the best age of guitars? Um, I think it is if you like inexpensive guitars. I think this is the best it's ever been so far. <laughs> it could get better, could be worse. Who knows? Um, in the expensive guitar world, you know, high-end guitar world, I don't think it's the, the golden age. I think we ha it had its golden age of when they were doing the best. And here's why I say that. You know, there are so many guitar brands, high-end brands that I look at now and I look at these three thousand, four thousand dollar guitars, and that's even you know that's you could say two thousand, but I just want to keep it three, four, five thousand dollar guitar prices, which sometimes saying that excludes even brands like Nags because they're four, five, six, seven thousand dollar price points. You know, uh, Sir guitars, they're definitely in the three thousands, like the entry level point for Sir. Sir is a four, five thousand, six thousand dollar price guitar company. So when you look at those prices, what I see when I look at those guitars as a consumer looking at them as a guitar nerd. Is a guitar player dreaming of another high-end, you know, exciting guitar to talk about or play? No choices, no no selection. It's just, just to me, when I go on Reverb and just use Reverb example, maybe again, you guys are different. If you have different thoughts, please, please share them. I go on Reverb and I type in something like Sir or something like uh, PRS or, um, you know, Nags. Nags excluded because they're pretty pretty crazy out there. So I don't want to give them, put them in that same in that same lumped up thing. But on the high-end guitar, sometimes I look at these guitars because, you know, I just want to look at them and I look at them and what I see is 600 listed and I look and it's 600 of guitars. But if I start counting different guitars, guitars that are different colors from, you know, right? So there's a red one, there's 50 red ones, there's 50 blue ones, there's 50 black ones, there's 50 white ones. And then there's one silver one and then it's over and they all have the same. It's like a very homogenized high-end guitar market is what I see. There's not a lot of excitement. I think, in my own opinion, so kill me if you want, <laughs> the most exciting high-end guitar company that I see when I see constantly stuff and I'm just wowed, it's Kiesel. Every time. Every time I see a guitar, every time I'm scrolling through Instagram with my thumb doing this thing that we do where you're just like looking at stuff, I see a guitar and I stop. It's always one of two companies. And when I say one of two, it's actually going to be either Kiesel or some 
boutique German, boutique, uh, you know, uh, Switzerland, New Zealand. It's always some kind of weird you know, <laughs> builder that I've never even really heard of, you know, Schmorgenborg guitars. And I'm, you know, and you look and it's exotic and exciting or it's a Kiesel. It seems like that's the, because of the fact that, because of the fact that Kiesel lets all of us just pick all kinds of crazy stuff. There's so exciting stuff. So, so to, to get to your question at the best point of way I can in the high end age, I think that day is gone. When I look at high end guitars, uh, in the eighties, seventies, eighties, nineties, and probably even sixties, but all, all those times there was a lot of different guitars, exciting guitars, it, not high end guitars, but just exciting stuff. Um, uh, and then, um, and then, and then in the, in the young, in the, uh, young, in the lower price points, I think they, I think you can have whatever you want. So I think there's just more exciting stuff. You know, uh, a perfect example of this is, um, look at what happened with my Ibanez AZ guitars. I bought, um, no, actually think about how horrible this is. Let's see if I can see it. Is it behind me? Ah, it's out. Kind of see it for those of you. Yay. If you're watching the show, you can see it. I'm pointing at it. It's in the corner of the room. That is the, um, I think it's called the Tequila Sunrise uh, Ibanez AZ made in Indonesia guitar. I reviewed that guitar twice now. I did a comparison video. I did a review of it. Um, that was sent to me by Ibanez. I got to keep that guitar. They didn't ask for it back. You know, uh, that was a guitar where they said, hey, would you like to review, a, I think, a bass or something I reviewed, a guitar. And I said, yeah, but I'd really like to review a prestige uh, uh, Ibanez. And they said, well, how about a premium one? <laughs> <laughs> and so they sent the premium and I reviewed it and I got gear math and I was so excited. I bought a prestige. And so now at some, at this point I've owned three prestiges, AZs. I still currently have two. Both are for sale, by the way. I don't want either one because I like my premium better. I like it. I think it feels as good. I think it stays in tune as well. I like the way it sounds, but more importantly, I am... And for just my own, what do you call it? Uh, not selfish, but um, superficial reasons. I'm sick of when my friends come over, and I mean friends like non-guitar player friends, tell me how nice that premium looks compared to the prestige. Like they like the the, the tequila sunrise, and I do too. I think it's a looks like a nice guitar. It reminds me of a really high-end ESP guitar. So it's funny to me why why I'm telling you the story is. What I would get from that as a new consumer, a new guitar player, a new person collecting guitars, buying guitars, getting a guitar, is for $1,000, you get a beautiful looking instrument, but for $2,000, you get a generic looking painted instrument that's not even an exciting new color. It's very, very generic. And so, um, and not that everybody's looking for something exciting, <laughs> but I am. How about that? I'm looking for something. There's a reason why a bunch of the guitars behind me, as you see, like that Nuno N4 and that Charvel that I, you guys, if you're listening, can't see, um, those are custom painted because I wanted something a little different. So that's a very long conversation on this subject, but it's still, I thought it was worth it. The golden age of, of inexpensive guitars, I think we're having it right now. I think this is if they're going to buy an inexpensive guitar, lower price guitar, whatever you want to call it, affordable, more affordable. Man, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. They're they're showing up the big guys in all ways. I I, I think so in my, in my opinion. And um and then on the high end guitars, it's a really hard thing to um to pull the trigger on. So um let's see what else. And then let's uh so nathan <laughs> just nathan's here nathan said the kiesel the custom he ordered was garbage he didn't like it i remember when he ordered that what happened with that one is he ordered one and he sorted for light um the problem is with that and because I, I was there when he he bought the guitar i think i was the one that told him he probably should send it back i think i might have if not i just I think i echoed the sentiment at that time um and i have friends who bought kiesels who have not been happy of course not, you know, but here's the thing with the Kiesel guitars for me, slowly as I've played more and more of them, um, I came to a, my own epiphany. It happens. Uh, so you guys know, I, I haven't told anybody this. Nathan knows this. I think Nathan is probably the only person or maybe Lawrence Petros maybe only knows this, but I, I just recently ordered another Kiesel. Um, I ordered a, an, another custom Kiesel. Uh, this one's probably the most extreme thing I've done in colors and choices and design and all that stuff. I went a little a little mad with it. Uh, and I'll share it with you, of course, when it comes in. And, of course, they do know it's going to me. So 
you know, like I've said before, if I get, uh, if, if it doesn't suck and you could argue that they didn't want it, you know, they wanted to send me a good one. Well then that's, you know, obviously could happen. They obviously know the channel and they value the channel. So there is a little bit of that there, but, um, but what's funny about Kiesel for me is I, I was thinking about buying how I bought a Kiesel, um, a couple weeks ago was I wanted a Tom Anderson. That's what it all started with. I just really wanted a Tom Anderson. I've been wanting a Tom Anderson for years. Something I think about, as you guys know, I talked about buying a Sir for years. Um, I owned a Sir before I got rid of it. Actually, I've owned two Sirs and got rid of them. And I was thinking maybe about another one because I was the AZs were going to go. That's kind of if you're doing the math with me, follow along, right? The two AZs are going to go. Th those I'll probably get at least fifteen for each. That's three grand. So I was like, oh, I can invest it into some other guitar. And exactly what I was telling you guys about. I feel like when I was looking at guitars for $3,000 used or thinking about ramping up some more money to a more expensive guitar, which was a lot of money, I just feel like I wasn't getting anything exciting. And I came to this conclusion, this is a this is true. I The Kiesel I ordered, compared to what I was looking at on the market, if I get this Kiesel and it's not great, I actually have enough money saved. I could buy that. I could buy two. I almost, I wouldn't do it, but I could, could have. I could buy two Kiesels identical and then hope that one of them comes out right. And I'd still have a few hundred bucks in my pocket compared to what the other guys were selling for. So like I said, it was, it was a, that's where I ended up on that. I'll share everything with you when the guitar comes, not only the review of the guitar and stuff, but you know why. Um, ben, Ben says, yeah, my Tom Anderson are my main squeeze. Yeah. Tom Anderson's I've played a few over the years. I've always really liked them. And, uh, and the problem for me, <laughs> John says, a lot of people are saying they want a Tom Anderson. My problem with Tom Anderson right now is the only problem, which is nothing with the guitars it's with me is that for the kind of money I have and am willing to pay for the, I, I don't get, I can't buy a whole lot of Tom Anderson. You know what I mean? I have to kind of find a, a used one, which is fine. I love used guitars. I'll buy most of my guitars are used almost nine. I don't know. At least 70% of the guitars behind me were bought used. So um, I don't have a problem with that. It's the, again, you you want to buy what you want. At, at this kind of money, you want to buy what you want. Yeah, I don't want to be like, yeah, I totally settled yeah, for a couple of Gs. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's a lot of money. You want to get what you want. So that's why I went the way I went. And uh, I don't know if I told you guys, but there's a Sir... Theos behind me. It's right next to the one Nathan made me, the PRS. It's funny that they're both there because it's probably, that's not a coincidence, by the way. Uh, not that I, they're sending this there. It's just that they're right there. Um, I've been putting those two in mo rotation probably more than any two guitars right now. Uh, in fact, I've been playing the Miro less. Obviously, since Nathan made me the guitar, I've been backing off the Miro almost exclusively to Nathan's guitar. And for some reason, my Strat has been taking a backseat to that Theos that I keep playing. In fact, <laughs> in fact, Oh, I got the lighting too dark today. I was going to say, if you look at the, the Theos behind me, you'll notice two things that you can definitely tell that when I'm playing a guitar a lot. And then uh, is one, it's got the DiMaggio strap locks. But more importantly, it's got plastic. Uh, I took the chrome knobs off and I put plastic uh, strat style knobs on it, which I had to buy from Kiesel because Kiesel uses solid shaft posts and you have to buy their their plastic knobs. Andy wants to know, Phil, have you ever played Ormsby? I have. In fact, uh, I played a bunch of Ormsby's, and one of the Ormsby's that I was really, really enjoying was he had some Indonesian ones at the NAMM show that I was in really, really impressed with. I did a uh, booth review and talked about it or something. You know, I did something on... Uh, there's a video of me talking about his booth on YouTube, and um, I just didn't pull that trigger. But yeah, that'd be a guitar I'd get. I'd get... If he still does those Indonesian ones, I'd probably get an Indonesian one. Uh, Harry says, good video with you and Eastwood Guitars. Thank you. You know, that was really great. Eastwood w uh, reached out to me. Um, and, and just Michael's a one hell of a guy. If you guys didn't watch that interview, I interviewed the owner of Eastwood Guitars, which is Airline Guitars, and he's the co-owner of Revolta Guitars. And um, we did a very candid interview. There'll be a podcast version of that. The podcast version will be longer. I think his is 18 minutes on YouTube. The podcast version will be like 40, 50 minutes on, uh, so much longer video, some, some more, just, uh, more in depth talk about certain subjects, but, uh, something to, to tell you that was really great is, uh, I asked him if he would come and do a podcast with me. He was so gracious with his time to do that video with me. Um, because he was one of the few companies that when he, re he reached out to me recently and said, hey, would you be willing to review a another Eastwood guitar? I'll send you one out. And I said, 
uh, I told you guys I've been doing this deal as much as I can with companies. I said, the deal I'm trying to do for 2021 is send me three guitars. I pick two, you pick one. And then I do three videos. And, and, um, he was like, absolutely no problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the reason is, is because I told him, which I'm telling all the companies is they send me something. And what they send me is something. Sure. They want your, your guys' eyeballs on. And I'm glad to talk about any guitar because it's a guitar channel and I love guitars, but it's sometimes more interesting for me to talk about the thing that I'm passionate for. So of course he doesn't need, and here's what, here's why I want to share this with you, why it's important to me. He doesn't need help selling Revolta guitars. The Revolta guitars are killing it. He's killing it. So you guys know, not only are they made in Korea in the Mir factory, each one is set up and inspected by Novo in Nashville. The two they sh shipped me had to come from Nashville because those those specific guitars, they don't go to where East... All the Eastwood guitars get inspected by Eastwood. He says it in the interview, if you watch him, he explains that they send those guitars to, to Nashville, right? So that they get set up and checked there. And... Um, the reason why I want to give him a big shout out again, and please, if you guys didn't watch the interview, watch it because it's just great to see people like him in this industry. Um, he didn't need any videos of a Revolta guitar, but I knew that you guys wanted a Revolta guitar on the channel and I wanted to do a Revolta on the channel. So guess what? I have two Revoltas. They should be here today. He sent, I got to pick them out. I'm doing two videos of them and then we'll do a video of an Eastwood guitar that he wants to, to, to have me talk about and show you guys. And, uh, I think it's a win-win for everybody. So I said, please come on a podcast with me. And he did, because that's what I'm looking for is these relationships uh, with companies where, um, you know, they care about us and we can care about them. And it just seems like a better environment. So instead of everybody looking for a, their a commercial. Um, let's see. Uh, hold on. I'm just looking at questions. Let me get back to some super chats too. I'm sorry guys, but I got to keep, keep on track with sometimes I let the super chat stack up a little deep and it gets a little trip problem, some messy, I should say. Uh, okay. So this is from Matthew. Matthew wants to know, have you, have I, he's talking to me, have you, have I, have I, uh, refused to fix a guitar because it was not repairable or it was not worth fixing question mark. What type of problems did they have? If so, um, that is an actually easy question. Here's why what, what you find with, uh, first it's very simple. Okay. You, I used to <laughs> used a long time ago beginning. I used to try to tell people my opinions about a repair and I realized that was dumb, right? Cause you don't tell the customer, the customer tells you. So when a customer comes in, um, with a guitar that's worth $70 and they go, we need this fixed. I've just learned instead of going, you don't want to fix that. You don't want to waste your time. I find it's just easier to give them a quote and then discuss it with them. So, Hey, it's going to be a $180 to fix the guitar. And then what happens is I watch them and most of the time they go, Oh yeah, never mind." And you go, okay, now that's my little, my time to, to bid the job. I, I don't mind losing a couple minutes of my, <laughs> my time for that. It's not, not a problem, but sometimes they go, okay. Now, what I do then is I go, okay, just to let you know, after the repairs are done, I'm going to tell you that this guitar is probably worth about $80. And what I find more times than not is the majority of the time they say, yeah, but it was my father's and we want it fixed. Or, yeah, but it was my brother's and, you know, something happened and he, I want it fixed. And so... um. Or, hey, I've had this one. Uh, yeah, but I was drunk and I, I broke it. I tripped over it. <laughs> I got to fix my roommate's guitar. Like all kinds of reasons. And then, therefore, I know money doesn't matter. So, the money doesn't matter that it's just matter that it gets done right. That's easy. Now, if they would say, sometimes they will say, I'll say, you know, hey, just so you know, this guitar is not worth that. Just so you know. I just want them to be aware of. Because I don't want anybody to come back on me later and go, yeah, you totally, you know, raked me off of the coals. $200 of repairs. The guitar is worth 30 bucks. I, I, as long as they know what they're getting into, it's not me to decide what they want to do with it. Um, but a lot of times they would say, oh, okay. If they don't say the, the emotional thing, they'll say, oh, okay, yeah. Ooh, so you, what would you do if you were me? That's usually what they want to do. Is they go say, And I always tell them, I go, well... It depends. You know, if you think you're going to play this guitar forever and you love this guitar, then spend the money. I would, me personally, I'm not attached to it emotionally. So my only decision would be financial, which would be to buy a better guitar. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, and stuff like that. Um, 
And uh, and uh, so this is actually uh, ties into a crazy thing that happens that doesn't happen to me anymore because now I just do repair. So I used to do repair in my store and there's a store aspect to that. W- one thing that used to crack us up at the store, we would have this problem where we, we learned we need to discuss that with people. You have to discuss people with value because sometimes this is what would happen to us. We would have on any given time, two or three classical guitars in the back of the shop that were restrung by us and never claimed. Um, and what would happen is people come in and go, how much for, you know, to restring a classical guitar? And we go, well, we charge, I think it was like $20 for the service. And then the strings are like, you know, 10 bucks. So it's like 30 bucks. And they go, okay, <laughs> you know, and, um, and so, you know, uh, just cause I can hear Ralph in my head. Cause Ralph would be saying this if he was here on the channel today, Ralph, I'll let you know the deal we had with customers, especially a lot of you guys that were customers of the store for a decade or so know this. When you came in for a restring in our store, the policy was really simple. It was like $20 for the restring or for free, we would let you do it at our bench and we would, uh, you know, supervise. We would just give you instruction. And that was your two options. 99% of the time, people just paid for it. They didn't want to do it. But every once in a while, somebody would be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do it. And we would do one and then let you do one. And and if you were doing fine, we'll let you continue on. Um, so anyway, so back to that thing. What happened was we would charge them $30 you know, for the strings and the service to restring a classical, which included oil in the fretboard and checking the guitar, make sure it's fine. And they would go home and figure out that they could just buy a classical for like 20 bucks. <laughs> I'm not kidding, on Amazon. And then you never come get the guitar. Um, or maybe they just didn't have the money. They never came get it. So, so that's why it's important to explain the value of things to a customer. It's again, not tell them what to do with their money or the decision, not only because it's not good etiquette, it's, and it's not good business. It's also not a, a, it's not a nice thing to do to somebody telling somebody what they should do with their money, you know, is, is, but you want to take a second just to give them what expertise or information you can from your your benefit of your experience, which is, you know, hey, just so you know, this is where I think you're going to end up if you do this. Um, and then in your case, your question is follow up question is what type of problems do they have? Um, the most common issue, the most common thing that you'll see for that is um, one of two categories when it comes to guitars that aren't worth repairing them. OK, uh, especially in a repair shop. Because remember, in a repair shop, I'm your biggest obstacle, the labor. When you do your own work, it's just parts. So putting $150 in parts into a guitar that's worth $100 doesn't sound like a smart idea to some. To some, it sounds like a great weekend. However, um, paying $200 in labor and $150 in parts, you see how this gets a lot worse. So it's a different thing. But what I was going to say was a lot of times... Broken headstocks, cra- broken anything, cracked fretboards, that stuff immediately, you know, $150, $200 in labor by the time everything's done. And if a guitar is only worth, you know, 150 bucks, it makes it almost impossible to justify that expense. If it wasn't serious repair like that, the only main thing that would really hinder a guitar's uh, value repair is the parts. Um, because as we all know, it's almost impossible to build a guitar with parts compared to what you know we can buy one overseas for. So uh, a perfect example of that is, let's say, take a Fender Strat. You know what I mean? Just a Squire Strat. You know, you get a, 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 a Affinity Squire Strat, you know, for $220 now. That's the going rate, right? New. And, um, you know, if just to buy pickups and a pick guard for that, you're going to be at 200 bucks unless you go with Guitar Fetish or some kind of, you know, inexpensive a company, which isn't going to give you much, in some cases, much better than what's already in the guitar. Some cases, yes, but some cases, no. So to answer your question, that's the main reasons why. But um, in most cases, if I inform them, they usually went with the right decision for them. And that's that's it. It's the right decision for them. Um, and so to answer a question you didn't ask, just because I'm sure maybe somebody's going to have a follow-up curious question, have I ever like, you know, had a, let a customer sink a uh, fortune into a guitar for a stupid reason? Yeah, including myself. I've done it two or three times now. Personally, I've shoved $800 worth of stuff, time, money, and parts into a guitar worth 100 bucks for some stupid reason. And because I've done it, uh, obviously other people have done it too. I've, I've done it for customers because they just have it in their head. You know, you know, I've, yeah, I've done it. I've done a lot of those things, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, trying to think of one in, in, in particular, I think, I think the craziest thing I remember doing was somebody brought me a Memphis guitar and it was some kind of Strat copy Memphis guitar. 
And I think we ran up, ran up like a $600 ticket in labor and parts to that guitar. And But the, cu- the customer was determined this was going to happen. They wanted it. So I'm like, all right, cool. I don't know if they kept it or if they're happy with it. Uh, I assume they were, they were fine. I never heard anything negative. Um, Dave's question is, Phil, if YouTube existed 30 years ago, then yeah, okay. Do you think newbies would have looked at awesome players out there and just given up and focus elsewhere? Maybe the next Eddie Van Halen quit today. No, I don't think that's the case. Uh, first of all, uh, it's just a, here's my 100% belief system. People, the personalities, the cultures, they don't change. And if they do, it takes an insane amount of time for, for that to happen. Technology changes. Technology changes what, how we, what we do, how we do, but not why we do it. Does it make sense? Uh, my favorite, favorite way to explain that is blockbuster video. Blockbuster video is gone. The idea of going to a store on Friday afternoon as soon as you get off work so that you can get there before the videos are rented out to get a video and get to the counter or standing by the counter and waiting for somebody to check in a video so you can get it. Um, That's gone. Now we stream it and we get it in a second and we click a button. However, we're still watching movies. We're still renting movies. We're still consuming movies the same same way, but mostly by our TV, right? We're watching our TV. So Blockbuster Video didn't go out of business because no one's watching movies anymore. (laughs) Or no one wants to rent movies anymore. Blockbuster went out of video because the way we do it changed. It just became easier, more convenient, or different. So do I think that if YouTube existed 30 years ago, we wouldn't see the artists that we saw 30 years ago? And the stuff? No, everything would still happen that way. It would just be consume it different. So to you, it would feel different. Maybe less exciting if 30 years ago, instead of seeing Eddie Van Halen on on uh, MTV in 30 years, I don't even think it was enough. Is that enough? That's not even enough. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go back 40 years ago, I think, almost, almost, right? So 30 years ago, you know, yeah, you see Michael Jackson, you see Eddie Van Halen, you see these guys on MTV, and uh, now we can see it on YouTube, and, and of course, and everybody else who's talented. But I think talent still rises to the top. I think everything, we still want to watch great guitar players. Um, I, I personally don't think anything's changed. I have this huge argument. Um uh, I'll, I'll just tell you, uh, next week's podcast, I think it's next week, if not, it's the following week, was with me and uh, Dave the Snake uh, Sabo from Skid Row. And in there, I said this, so I'm just re- regurgitating what I said there. When his band started Skid Row, uh, I started playing guitar in 88. His band kind of hit the scene in 89. Metal was dead. That's what all I heard. When I went to school and I was like, I was going to learn guitar and impress the ladies. <laughs> and they weren't impressed with guitar players. That 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 was yeah, that's something that you have to be at least five years older than me to say. Like, oh, my band, we used to play, and girls would like what? Girls? I didn't have girls at my show. <laughs> when I played when I played music, there was twenty dudes with their arms crossed staring at me, <laughs> and my mom. See, uh, so um, so anyways, um. But what's my point? My point is, is that um, we perceive things differently. We see things differently. We even do things in the way that technology involves us do things. But I think the same things come to bear. Um, uh, you know, I see a good example. You're talking about YouTube. You know, let's say what YouTube could YouTube. Uh, I, I hear this as a as a person who makes a lot of content on YouTube. Uh, YouTubers get a lot of people to buy a lot of gear. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> yes. We, then, then we should all be, I should be a millionaire, uh, and companies should be, I shouldn't even be able to do a show because my phone should be ringing because companies are like, Oh, Phil, you're every guitar player buys gears. Cause you know, cause you say to no, um, you out there, I'm just going to call you on it. All you guys watching 1,147 of you, not all of you, but I'll call a bunch of you. You know who I'm talking to out there. You guys buy gear. You don't need me. I'm your excuse. You look at my wall and go, well, I don't have as bad as that guy. (laughs) Or maybe you're like, oh, I got it better than that guy. I don't know. Either way, my point is, uh, my guess is if you're watching a gear channel on YouTube, other than learning information, which is a very, very, uh, very good part of what what it is we get to do here. um, Look, I I was that guy that um, that got the Guitar World magazine and then flipped to all the ads. And I went to the ads first. I didn't read a single article until I saw every single ad. If you know exactly what I'm talking about right now. That's you watching gear channels. You didn't need gear channels to be that way. You were that way when you had magazines. 
So I guess that's a, a, a very safe way to say that people generally don't change. You know what I mean? Like I said, not very quickly. Cultures, personalities, uh, as people, we, we take a long time to change. So um, I don't think YouTube would have changed a whole lot. Um, the only thing that I think that can affect artists now is we used to not all have to listen to everybody's opinion about everything. And that's, uh, you know, obviously as a channel that reviews stuff that has an opinion, I guess I'm calling myself on this too. But um, like, it was funny. Uh, I just, uh, I was just, my wife took a car to, to, to service at the dealership and I got like three questionnaires, whatever, after the experience sent to me and a call and they have to know what I think. And I'm like, man, it's like you can't do anything anymore. I told my wife, I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't uh, didn't fill out the questionnaires. I didn't respond to the call. And my wife's like, oh, you're going to do it? And I said, no. I said, every time I go anywhere now or do anything, somebody needs to know what I thought of the experience. I go, remember when you just did stuff? And if there was something wrong, you'd let them know? <laughs> Why does everyone have to give you an opinion on everything, about everything? That being said, I have a channel that gives you my opinion. <laughs> I don't know. You get, you get, I guess hopefully you guys know what I'm saying. Otherwise. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's go to the next one. <laughs> let's go to the next question. All right. The next one is JSL. JSL says, Hey Phil, I hope all is well joining in for the rare live stream. Uh, it says, uh, just picked up an EVH LBX and cab stoked. Have a great weekend. I have the LBX. I love the LBX. I had, I've had, I've not tried the stealth. Everybody asked me if I tried the stealth, the new one, the dark one. I haven't. The one I currently have now is the uh, black faced one that has the two channels that are clean and dirty. And, uh, and I've done, I had both. I did a video of both. And in that video, I think I said, I love the sound of the first one, the all white one, uh, the white face one. I'll just call it that. And, uh, which I still do to this day, but I liked having a clean channel for pedals. It, it's because I wanted that LBX because, um, oh, well, I bought it cause he, Eddie died and I missed having mine. <laughs> so I bought it, but now I'm using it on a Marshall cabinet, uh, in the shop. Uh, six string Steve says, would you have any hesitation buying a Fender Tele American pro two made in pine? Okay. Uh, would you prefer a used American standard in ash unable to pay? Oh, to play in a local store and compare. So this is uh, hopefully will help you on this answer. There is, there is one, I think pine guitars are cool, especially like tellies. I don't have a pine telly. Um, there was a Pine Squire that we sold once in the store. And I remember thinking, like, I, I don't even remember what model it was. I just remember loving it and, uh, and thinking, what is this? And then I looked in the specs and I'm like, oh, Pine. I know the some of the original tellies, I think, were Pine. There was all kinds of stuff made of Pine. They've done some high-end guitars out of Pine. I, I like it. I think it's cool. So to to answer your question, would I, uh, would I have a problem with a new American telly made of Pine? I don't. I think it's really cool. Um, but... Uh, or what I prefer, and that's what you're asking me, the Ash one. Well, it's not that I would prefer it. If I had an opportunity right now, if I had two American professionals in front of me, tellies, a new one and an old model one, and the old model one was Ash and the new one was Pine, and the Ash one was less money, I would go with the Ash. And here's why. Um, first, if you buy used, you're going to save money anyways. It's just good. Also, um, you know, Ash is one of those things. We don't know, you know, what's going to happen with these Beatles and all this other stuff, right? They basically, a lot of companies have backed off of it. It could be uh, rare. And also Ash, when it's right, when it's the right weight and it does things, uh, it's it's great. Um, it sounds great. It's got a good resonance to it. It thumps a little bit. Um, I had a, uh, I had an Ash Telly and I sold it like an idiot. <laughs> And the one I have now is older and I had to change out the pickups and, and do whatever I can, which I finally was able to do to get it to kind of sound and thump. I, I guess thump is the word I want to use to, to have those notes pop the way they did. But, um, but I would prefer, I would prefer the Ash one, but I wouldn't have a problem with the Pine one is what I'm basically saying. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence is saying, I'll take a nice piece of ash over a plank of pine any day. Yeah. Like I said, it, it's not that pine's bad for me. It's not that pine's bad or there's an issue with it that I would say to stay away from. I'm not even worried about it being soft or shrinking to me. I like basswood and I have a lot of guitars made of basswood and I can't imagine I'd have to look, I think basswood's gotta be softer than pine. If not, it's damn close. <laughs> um, so, but ash is just, it's just, I, I would rather have ash if I could get it. 
I wouldn't pay more. So you understand what I'm saying for the advice, if it helps. If I had an opportunity to buy, let's say the same price or less ash, I'd probably go that route, but I wouldn't pay more. It doesn't matter. It, w- it wouldn't matter to me enough to pay more. Okay. JB says, what's the green telly in the corner? That is my uh, GNL ASAT ASAT uh, Telecaster <laughs> that they can't call Telecaster uh, in Margarita Metallic. Somebody, I hope they're wrong. They, I saw it in a passing comment, I think on a video. Somebody told me to discontinue that color. I hope they didn't. It's great. <laughs> so if they did, well, that sucks. But that's uh, that's what it is. Dual humbucker, nothing special. It's not. It's an older body uh, with a arm carve, hardtail, two humbuckers, stock uh, GNL humbuckers. There's a total review on it. You can watch the whole video of me talking about it. I uh, I ordered it when I went to uh, their facility and did uh, interviews with them and checked out the facility and stuff. And then I ordered one that day. I was in love. Okay, next. I don't know why I say next. It's like, I feel like I'm at a counter. You guys all have numbers. Next. Who got the pastrami and rye? Uh, Jam Man did. Jam Man says, thoughts on a Strat pickup in a telly? Yeah. <laughs> thoughts? Doesn't doesn't really appeal to me. I'm When I like tell look, I like tellies. So to me, tellies are about two things for me. Either make a telly a telly, so use telly pickups. Or make a telly kind of like this hybrid Les Paul thing that tellies get to do, man. When you put humbuckers or P90s in tellies, they got this just killer tone uh, that I think is kind of like a Les Paul, but more mids. It's just a really co- cool vibe. Um, I found I found that my, over the years, you know, is trying guitars, playing guitars, playing music with them, trying to figure out, you know, where, where do I find myself? Where do I find myself swimming? in the stream of, of tones and sounds and music. I used to be like, well, I love the way strats play. So I play strats, but I, I like the way they sound, but I don't love the way they sound. I kind of like the way Gibson Les Paul sound. And so then it became like, okay, well I'll use a Les Paul for the tone and I'll play a strat when it's comfortable. And I kept doing this. And over the years, I've just kind of found a tellies, uh, like a nice little in the middle kind of thing. And whether it has telly pickups or humbuckers, that's a great thing about tellies. When you get a telly that's right, even when it's got telly pickups, they sound huge huge you massive it sounds great so it's a great compromise so um i have no so basically that's my way of saying i've had no desire to stick any kind of strat style pickups in a telecaster so although i do have a somnium guitar which is like a tele shaped body i can stick strat pickups in and when i do it sounds like a strat <laughs> that's kind of and that's kind of my thoughts so i guess oh you know uh, i did have a james burton telly for a, 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 from like I, I owned it in 2005 or six and I had it for three years I had the blue one and uh, it had lace sensors single coils and I, I love that guitar I only got rid of it for one reason I got to the point where I was like why do I have a Strat that looks like a telly and I got rid of it and I don't know if I regret it I think I'm happy with way where I am now Douglas says is this total crazy idea okay let's 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 go he's asking all of us now I want to buy an eight string neck okay pickups, etc., and put them into the body of a cheap guitar. For example, Glary. Uh, yeah, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't know why you'd want, sure. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, a better question would be like, you know, hey, do you have, Douglas, do you have some free time? <laughs> Are you trapped in the snow and you can't leave the house for a week or so? and you happen to hopefully have electricity, then yeah, do that. It's a, not a wise choice with your money, but as someone who's taken a glary and shoved a ton of money into it and done videos, and uh, I could love to, I would love, trust me, Douglas, I'd love to sit here and go, well, Douglas, the reason I did it is I'm a YouTuber and I, I got a, a 50,000 views. And let me tell you, all the views of those, that glary guitar that I converted into the, the nice guitar, I think I did three videos. I think if you collectively count those views, they didn't pay for crap. <laughs> so that was just my shenanigans. Um, I was <laughs> I was better off just doing a, something else. But like you, Douglas, I had it in my craw to do something. So if it's in you to want to shove an eight string neck on a glary body, 
I'm, I'm telling you the only thing you're going to get out of that is hopefully some experience from it, but also hopefully a good time doing it, but that's it. At the end, there'll be no value proposition and I don't know, unless you can make a great clickbait video, <laughs> maybe they get away, you know, it's, it, it doesn't work. Greg says, cheers, Phil. Heard uh, you talk about your time and APG. So I would imagine it's, uh, he's in Baltimore. So I'm thinking it's Aber Aberdeen, Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Yep, that's where I was at. Uh, just south of there. Small world. Thanks for all you do. Greg, uh, I, yes, I did talk about it. So yes, um, uh, when I was in, you know, in the Army, I was at uh, Aberdeen, Aberdeen Proving Grounds. I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you what, it's a very lame story. I make fun of myself. I try to in the channel. Don't take yourself too seriously is what I hope I convey in that. Let me tell you a, a funny thing, funny, I'm jumping around screens. I'm sorry. Let me tell you a funny thing about my time in Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Um, that was my first time when I got sent there. That was my first time on the East Coast. I was born in California. I was pretty much raised in Arizona. Uh, since I was like 10 years old. So since I was 10 years old, I've been in Arizona. So, so there you go. Um, I had never, well, first I've never seen the cold before. So let me just start there. Okay. Um, but Greg, I had never seen steam come out of the ground. And when I say come out of the ground and, and all you guys from the East coast and around the world with cold, you're going to hopefully have a good laugh. And, but you West coasters that have never been to the East coast, I'll explain it to you. They just have steam when it's cold coming out of the sewer. And so what would happen was when we would go places, when we would march places or go anywhere, I would hold my breath every time we went over the steam because to me, I'm like, that's like poop steam, right? I was like, I was freaking out. I'm not kidding. It was like a big deal to me. It was like, is that, is that piss? Like what is coming out of the ground? It's just steam. And it was like, so uh, I basically... They would make fun of me for holding my breath, <laughs> but I had never seen that. And then I would try to explain to them like where I live, steam just doesn't come out of the sewer. You know what I mean? Or out of the vents. And they would explain it to me. And, uh, yeah. So I never, the entire time I was there, I could never come to terms with not holding my breath. To me, it's still a creepy thing to think that when you get that steam come out, you know, through your coming because it comes through your feet, through your whole body as you walk by. I just remember thinking, this is gross. <laughs> so now Michael says, let, let me tell you, Michael, I know. He says, it's just stormwater, rain runoff. Yeah. But where I live, that's where that's where the shit is. <laughs> so I held my breath. I'd like to say I was a younger, dumber version of me at that time because I was, but um, I still probably don't want to walk in <laughs> anything steaming out of the ground. But there you go. There's my Aberdeen story for you, Greg. I hope I hope that uh, you get a chuckle out of that. Or um, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Poop steam. There you go. Uh all right, uh, we have, what do we have? Let me keep going. Let's why not? We have uh, S Fort Fort for music. S, S Fort, yeah, S four. Oh, S four. No T. S four for music. S four far music. S four with a bunch of random capital letters and then S four for uh, music. Okay, I'm with you. S four far music. Sometimes we need these sign-ons with commas. That would help. Because I made me think that's what it is. Hey, Phil, I've been looking at a Godin acoustic since you mentioned the Godin a lot on the show. Uh, I like a few of them, but they all have rich light fretboards. Is there a real noticeable difference with the wood? No, I really, I really like uh, rich light. I, I've said this before. I'm very, I'm a fan. I'm on board. I love the idea of rich light. I'm all there. I am just my only exception, rich light. And I'm sure Al John's here. Hey, Al John, he, he's heard this. They all hear it. My only complaint about Rich Light is I don't want it on a $4,000 guitar unless that $4,000 guitar is like a $5,000 guitar, $4,000. In other words, I, I, what I love about Rich Light is it's great quality. It looks great. It, it saves, you know what I mean? It's consistent. It's got a consistent C to it. Um, I think it looks, you know, I said that it looks great. You get the idea. I'm for it. Uh, Godin uh, is using it, and uh, I don't think Godin does anything uh, half ha hazard hazardly. Like Godin's... 
a company that really focuses on quality. And so, and, and obviously Gibson uses it. All kinds of companies use it. I think it's great. And, uh, and the, uh, you know, and the only time I'm not in love with Rich Light is, like I said, sometimes I'm like, man, I just feel like if when you hit the high price crazy, I've arrived. You know what I mean? I got the Cadillac Baritz or I got the, you know what I mean? The crazy Mercedes or whatever you got. And you're, you're like, this is where you're going to be in life. And you got this thing. When you're buying that level of guitar, I don't want to hear about Rich Light or anything. I want to, you know, it's, I, and it's maybe my age. Just maybe me. I think expensive guitars should be exotic and crazy and unique or something. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but tone wise, I have no complaints for rich light. Like I said, I don't even complain about the $4,000 guitar with it. It's not like I'm saying it sounds not as good as ebony. I just feel like, you know, you should get a slab in ebony. When you, <laughs> if I can buy a really nice jet ski or a guitar, I want that guitar to have some nice stuff. Cause you ever seen somebody on a jet ski? They look like they're having a lot of fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Steven says, I can only afford poor light. Yeah, but rich light's great. So to answer your question, I wouldn't uh, have any issues with it. And I don't think they're the only ones using rich light and acoustics. Isn't uh, isn't Martin also using a lot of rich light now in acoustics? Uh, a couple of the companies have seen it too. Really good stuff. Okay. Uh, we have, we have, who do we have next? We have Joseph. Joseph says, hey, Phil, how and what to safely use to clean guitar cables and the end of the plugs. Also, what is the best plugs to replace where, where to buy them? Um, I like, I, I like switchcraft for ends on cables and I like Neutrik. Um, I pretty much use Neutrik for everything now. Uh, that's what I, I do. Um, I just like them cause I like those breaker cables. Do I have one? I do somewhere. I just play guitar. I did. Okay. For those that can watch, I'm holding up one of these. Uh, this is a Klotz cable. Um, but I have a bunch of cables now with these um, uh, these ends. This is a Neutrik end. It's red, and it's got this little compression spring. See this? I'm sliding it down. Here you go. Get out of the way for those. You can see. And what happens is uh, this is dead. So if it's plugged in the amp, it's nothing. You plug it in, it works. These are fantastic. This changed my life. Not kidding. I don't own a cable now that doesn't have this on there. Um, so that's what I use. Although I like Switchcraft. If they have a version of that, great. If anyone has a version of that, great. I'm just using Neutrik because that's what it's got. Um, and then for cleaning my cables, uh, I'm not kidding. I use uh, I, I have uh, shop cloths, which are microfibers for the most part, but I have cotton cotton cloths. But I use a microfiber cloth, and I usually spray some kind of guitar polish. Just mist it. Everything to me is like I just need the cloth to get wet with something, and I'll just use that. I'd probably use Windex to clean a guitar cable. I could care less. Um, the end, same thing. It's um, Again, it's for usage. What what are you cleaning off the cable? Me, because where I live, it's dirty because it's in the desert. So a lot of times if I have a cable uh, after a gig, it's just coated in powdered dust from the dirt. You know what I mean? Or the dirt from the stage and dirt. So I'm just wiping the dirt off. So I just, something I can mist onto a, a cloth just to get some, some, something to grab onto the dirt and I just wipe it down and save the ends. And I, and I do do that. I do do. I do that uh, uh, quite often. I wipe down my cables. Um, because they're expensive. <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> Smoky Sound Studio says, just bought my first baritone Gretsch uh, 5260 or 52060 or 55260. Wondering, <laughs> wondering about action compared to regular guitars. Uh, thanks. Uh, you mean like setting your action? Um, with a baritone guitar, you want to be like a bass guitar in the idea that you can't slam it on the deck uh, uh, unless you're going to play slappy poppy kind of stuff with your action on your bass. But a baritone can still have a really low action. You, you can get away with, you know, you you will never get away as low as a, a actual regular guitar. It's just those strings are just too big. It's just like a bass. You need a little clearance on there. So to answer your question is the action should just be a little higher, but I mean, it shouldn't be noticeable. It just be a little higher. John Owen six can't play any ruddy. <laughs> wow. Have too many questions. Okay. To answer. You have too many questions to answer. Here's some distortion for the tone jar. Oh, thank you, buddy. He's just giving me a super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, Mathis says, hey, Phil, a silver, a silver of vacation. Wait, a silver of vacation again. And this is where I tune in to get my mind right. Oh, okay. 
So I, I think he's saying that he's just enjoying the show. <laughs> I know what you're saying, Mathis. I'm with you. You're enjoying the show. It's nice to get your mind right. Reset. I find Friday's a nice little reset. So today, especially, I uh, this is one of the few podcast shows that I have that are sandwiched. In other words, I had a meeting today, a Zoom meeting today uh, that was very good. And then I got to have a quick lunch and then I'm doing the podcast and after podcast, I got to do the interview thing. Derek says, hey, Phil, what percentage of sub $1,000 guitars would you say would benefit from replacing the stock nut? Seems like most problematic part on every guitar I've picked up recently. Thanks. Yeah. What percentage of them? Um, uh, 70 and I'm just making stuff up. But of course, I'm just going to go off the sub $1,000 guitars. I actually, you know what it is with nut? I just don't like plastic. <laughs> uh, I, the one question I get asked the most when it comes to nuts by friends, by family members, by viewers is like bone nut, graphite, you know what I mean? Aluminum, brass. And I'm always like, yes. And they're like, which one do you like most? And I go, I, I don't know, bone? I, I, it depends on the question. <laughs> what do I like the way it sounds? What do I like to work on? Uh, I like working on bone because it's easy. <laughs> you know, my files cut through it and it turns it into powder and it's just an easy thing. Some people don't like working on bone because it smells. I'd rather smell what smells like burning hair than file for an extra two minutes. You know what I mean? Because to me, it's about how fast I can get something done. Uh, and, you know, I mean, and accurate, and good and consistent, fast, good, consistent work. It's what pays the bills. So I like bone for that. Um, for ease, for you, for the average viewer, consumer, guitar player, I like uh, GraphTech and New Bone stuff, which is also GraphTech company, because that stuff you can drop in. It's easy. Work with it easy. It's cheap. I like Bone, by the way. So cheap, and you can buy multiples. That's really great. What I don't like is plastic. I don't know why it's ever been used other than just really low-grade student guitars. It's funny to me how many guitars just have cheap plastic nuts. Um like I said, the only thing I can say good about it is I guess it's easy to work on because you can file through it easy and sand on it easy and move, you know, but really, no, it sucks. Um, and I love brass. In fact, if you guys notice, a lot of times when I'm doing any kind of guitar builds on my own, I've used brass almost every time. I like brass. Um, the uh, My bass, my main bass, which is not in here. <laughs> it's usually right there. I moved it in the other room. It has a brass nut. A lot of my guitars have brass nuts. Um foodie foodie betty reaction chan which i think is kind of pretty short for channel foodie betty reaction channel says nano amps tell me something on them i think you're talking about the nano amps from hughes and kittner they have new pedals right a new uh nano pedals nano amps i have still not tried the hughes and kittner nano amps um all i can tell you about the nano amps is this when i was in germany uh at hughes and kittner which uh, was a very cool time. And I tried the spirit amp. And if you guys saw that video is when I went out in the middle of nowhere and cranked it and just, it was crazy loud. I was just blown away. Um, one of the things about them is they're using their, uh, their tech nanotech that not nanotube. What do they call it? They, the spirit, you know, orange goo. I call it the orange sunny D delight goo stuff. Um, Please, anyone knows the name of it. I, for some reason, is escaping me now, that technology. When I was there, I said over and over again, I would love, I would kill, I would do whatever, you know, I would like buy them dinner or beers, whatever. I would just love one of those orange things because I want to see it. I'd like to talk about it on the channel. What is it? You know, and one of the things about that uh, that was not, that happened was they couldn't give me one because it was so, super top, top secret. Apparently, they said they encapsulate them in, in um an epoxy, which is, I said that was fine. I would take one in epoxy and they send them to China to have the amps made and they don't want the Chinese to reverse engineer the amps. So they that's why they encapsulate this in epoxy and it's, uh, this super easy, awesome technology and it's very expensive. This is the important part. They told me it was very expensive. I'm a skeptical person. I don't care how nice of a company they are, good friends they are. I'm always skeptical. I'm always like, okay, is it really what I think it is? And so when they said it was expensive, I was like, well, you know, hey, what do I know? And then when they came with the nano amps, the nano amps have that same technology, but they're less expensive. So either they got the price down or it wasn't that expensive. I don't know. But I haven't tried one of their amps. <laughs> so there you go. And I have no real ah, spirit tone generator. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, what I can tell you is I love that product. It sounds good. So I'm on board. I, I don't know if it's a spirit tone generator or if just they know how to set the EQs and set the tones or if they just, you know, do it really good. I, I don't know what the excitement is. So on the nano amps, I guess if it's the spirit tone generator and they shove it in there, it's good. I guess it's good, but I haven't tried them. But so, you know, I have not a lot of interest to try the nano spirit amps because I have a spirit amp. So I, it has all those amps in it. <laughs> uh, so I think it's more for players who don't want all the features of the fully loaded amp, but just want like a streamlined one thing. Although their new pedals look pretty cool. Really cool. Okay. As I... <laughs> just so, some of the comments. Uh, Eric the Red says, less than 300 likes is depressing. Okay, so if you want to hit the like button, it'd be a, that's a good reminder to do it. <laughs> Remember, if you hit the like button on the channel, it'll make the snow melt where you live, and you'll be fine. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, that's a little fun fact. The th thumbs ups melt snow. There you go. <laughs> David says, hey, Phil. I love my MT-15. He's talking about the Mark Germani 15 PRS amp, but damn, it's loud. Yep, at night. Any recommendations for a 5-watt tube amp? Thanks. Yeah, here's what you got to do. You got to get the, uh, the um, well, you can get a ton of these different ones. I'm just giving you a suggestion one. Get, um, hold on a second. Oh, as I hit the mic and knock things around, so professional around here. Uh, this is the JHS thing. <laughs> This is a JHS little black amp box. These work great. There's tons of these things out there, but this thing's 45 bucks. And uh, I feel like I'm for 45 bucks, it's it's a pretty, um, you know, reasonable amount of money for a purchase, uh, you know what I mean, for something like this. Uh, I would buy this. What this is, basically it's a volume knob. You can use a volume pedal. I have a video where you just use a volume pedal. Although I like this better than the volume pedal because it's a little easier to control, as you can see, as I'm turning it. Um, but you're basically gonna insert this in the effects loop of the amp, turn this, this becomes the master volume on that amp. That will solve that problem for $45. The reason I tell you that is because before you go out and buy yourself a brand new amp, <laughs> spend $45. <laughs> or you can go on Amazon because I'm sure somebody's going to comment in the comments. You could pick one of these up for 10 bucks or build one for a dollar or whatever it is that people tell you when they can save money. I'm just telling you, this is the one I can recommend because this is the one I use and I have and I bought it. I don't remember. Oh, I bought on Reverb. 45 bucks. I remember shipped. Actually, I think I paid $43 because it said offer. I'm not making this up. I think I'm pretty sure it was $45 or make offer. So I said 43 and they took it because I thought, well, <laughs> they, the button's there. Might as well save a buck. So there you go. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I have to figure out where I'm at now. I'm with David. I'm different David though. That was David Hunter. This is David Hebert. Says, hey, Phil, I've got a guitar with a satin finish that is wearing and turning glossy in some spots. What is the best way to even out the finish and bring the rest of the guitar to light gloss? I don't know. But if we're lucky and Nathan's still hanging out, he probably knows the answer. If Nathan, if you're still out there, please put a comment on the best way to do that. Um, I've never I've never had to do that because I don't do finish work. So I've never really, it's one of those things that I just don't really handle. I usually send all finish work to somebody who does finish. Um, I specifically, uh, if you've paid attention, oh, actually here, here's a perfect example. Uh, since I've been on YouTube doing, uh, personal, you know, or not personal, just doing reviews personally, or, you know, I mean for companies or whatever. Um, I have only had one satin finish guitar on the channel. And that was that green Charvel. And remember I sold it and bought the black one that, you, that it got painted blue. And everybody's like, Oh, what happened? What happened to the guitar? I actually loved it. And I love the green. I just like you starting to shine a little bit on my arm part. And I'm like, I don't want this. I don't want a shiny one spot. Some people love that. Some players love this whole, you know, the relicking thing happening. Uh, it just wasn't my thing. So um, I, I think if the green on the guitar was glossed, I would have kept it like my Strat, but it was satin. So I got rid of it while it still had value to get rid of before I shined it up too much. So uh, that's a, my very long answer to tell you I don't know the answer. But if Nathan comments an answer, I would go with what Nathan says since he does finish work for Jackson Guitars and, and Charvel's. 
PRSs. Uh, and if not, if he doesn't answer today, I will find out and then we'll talk about it next week. Uh, Jack says, what does Jack say? He says, what is the best way to contact you to send a guitar to be repaired? So with guitar repairs, what happens now is everybody always asks me that. And my biggest problem is I'm always in a backlog. So it becomes, uh, it's, it's kind of like, this is, this is the only way I can explain it. When people send me emails, you guys send me emails or send me texts. Cause some, my, all my local customers usually have my number. They text me, uh, Sometimes, I mean, if you're, if you're a customer I've known for a long time, or if I have, you know, if you're in my system already, I just respond to you and say, Hey, this is where I can have availability. Usually if I'm not responding, it's cause I just don't, I, other than telling you, I can't get to it until two weeks from now, which usually a lot of times people go, Oh, that's great. Here's what everybody does to me. Everyone loves to tell me how it's no problem. How long anything takes. Meanwhile, I'm too tenured and been doing this too long to be stressed out about the fact that somebody's like, yeah, oh, take as long as you need, Phil. I'm fast when I get the guitars. I flip them fast, but I'm always in a backlog. So I go, oh, I can't get to it for two weeks. And they go, that's no problem. <laughs> and then three days later, like, but if you get to it today, that'd be great. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. So um, so that's the answer to your question. You just email me through uh, pmcknight7 at gmail.com. Um, and, uh, and, and also, you, you need to be local. I had, I had pre COVID and a couple times during COVID now, but very few times people have shipped me guitars and I've done stuff, but I am really nervous right now with shipping. Uh, I, I had a guitar overnighted from Florida to Arizona on Monday. It's still not here. It was overnighted from Florida to Arizona. Obviously the weather, it's not here. <laughs> it's not even close to being here. It's still, I, I think it's in Tennessee as of today. Florida, Tennessee, five days on an overnight shipment. It's a scary time to be shipping guitars. So I don't want to do it if I can't help it. Um, and I love repairing guitars. And I, trust me, sometimes I wake up and I go, I think I'm going to not do YouTube and just do the repairs because I'm busy enough doing just that one thing. Sadly enough, please, somebody's going to suggest this. They always do. Why don't you get help? That was the plan. And then COVID happened. There was going to be somebody in helping and COVID kind of messed that. It's made it a really gray area of when to pull that trigger. So we'll do, I'll keep you guys updated though. You'll know before anybody else what I'm doing. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, harmful bot <laughs> with a PB logo is his avatar says, Phil, any thoughts on acrylic Lucite guitar bodies? They're heavy, man. They're heavy. If you have not owned one, there is enough of you watching right now. I know it because I've done it too. I've owned two acrylic Lucite bodies. Um, I had the BC Rich Green bass, not the guitar like everybody thinks. I had the Mockingbird bass with the green as headstock. And then I, oh, you know what? I had more than that because then I had a Dan Armstrong Ampeg one. And then I've owned a uh, Strat one, <laughs> one of those fake Stratty ones. Remember, you could buy those on eBay for like 150 bucks. I'm like, and I did what everybody said they were going to do. I'm going to get it and put a real strat neck on it and make a fender clear strat. And then I got it and it was like 6,000 pounds <laughs> and they don't sound great. Uh, I don't think they sound bad. They just don't sound great. So you, at least you're like, you, you'd like, okay, look, I want my back to know that it's working for tone. <laughs> Sure, sure. You're going to need a chiropractor, but listen to your tone, <laughs> right? That's what I need to happen. And it, instead, it was just heavy as hell and didn't sound that awesome compared. Um, so uh, that's my thought on them. They're heavy as hell. <laughs> if you want one, you should get one. But if you are not a fan of really heavy guitars, you are not. You're going to be disappointed. Okay. Uh Guillermo, Guillermo says, can't make up my mind. A PRS S2 or PRS CE, your opinion, please. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Um, so in this qu in this question, which is great, is the PRS S2 is, of course, this, the uh, the Maryland PRS2, Stevensville 2 guitars, which are stripped down ones. I have a semi-hollow um, single cut PRS S2 in black that I absolutely adore. I love that guitar. And um, I have a video about that guitar coming. I'm, I'm pretty... I hope I'm I hope I hope it's gonna be cool because it's a little different way to talk about that guitar and what I'm planning to do to it. Um, 
PRS CE to me. So here's what I want to get on this. I actually love the way the S2s play and sound. I actually think I prefer them sometimes to the cores because of just the way they kind of feel to me. But the CE feels like um, it feels like a more like legitimate PRS. In in PRS world, they think of them as the same. There's like you know, private stock, you know, and then there's core with all the artists and tin top stuff, but it's like private stock core. And then there's the S2 and the S2 and the, the CEs kind of live in this equalized line. And then underneath that, you would have, of course, the SE line, right? Um, and then artist guitars like John Mears and stuff kind of float in there and stuff. So PRSism is equal. I kind of, for some reason, even though that kind of, that can see that point because they kind of have the same kind of a uh, bridge and you know, both have like an import bridge, both have like imported pickups. Um, I kind of look at the CA as being more premium. Like it's a more premium, it's more like the core. I think it's because, and here's why, because again, I'm trying to articulate this thought. I look at the CE as I could buy a core. When I see somebody with a CE, I think, oh, you could buy a core, but you wanted a bolt-on. You know, like you could have got a core custom 24, but you wanted a bolt-on. When I see an S2, uh, it's like, oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? You didn't get this core, <laughs> right? And I know I, I sounds stupid the way I'm saying that because I have an S2, and I obviously kept it over my, my CE, but I kept my S2. And my S2's purposes, they don't really make, well, they do. They make uh I don't know why I like it. <laughs> this is this is the worst advice ever. Um, Ellen says the P, uh, PRS S2 has the pattern regular neck, which is wonderful. Yep. And so, you know, the CE will have the wide thin neck or pattern thin neck. Um, but quality wise, I think they're the same quality. I just think that's the only advantage of the CE gives you is, oh, if you want the smaller neck, one. Thank you, Ellen, for pointing that out. Uh, if you want the smaller neck, go with the, the CE. If you want the slight, and the necks are very, very similar. But if you want the slightly thicker neck, go with the uh, the uh, S2. But I don't know. I uh, Bam Mazi says CEs have core U.S. made pickups, S2s, and CE share pickups. CEs, I don't think that's accurate. I think CEs have 8550. Teens. I don't know if it's the same as the core. He might be right. That might be true. I don't remember. So, I I don't know. To me personally, I just found myself playing my same Mira, the, um, you know, until Nathan made me guitar. So I kind of found myself doing that. So I kind of lost the whole need to play my C. So I sold it. And then my S2 single cut has a, something unique about it. So I kind of stick with that. The best part of this is I love saying this, man, you, this is a problem. I, I love, uh, because it's not a problem. You have, you have the opposite of a problem. <laughs> Either way, you're going to have an amazing guitar. Talk about that's what's great. That's why sometimes this is a nice little break from the rest of the world. This isn't problems. You're like, ah, I can't make up my mind. You're like, this is the best decision ever. Um, so that's the thing I would focus on if I was you is focus on the next, which neck you want. And if you don't know, you're going to have to figure that out. Just remember the S2 neck is going to be a little chunkier than the CE neck. And that will make, hopefully make things a little easier. So thank you, Ellen, for pointing that out. Grumpy Mike Guitar says, happy weekend, Phil. A little something for the tone jar and why not? Thank you, Grumpy Mike. Uh, I haven't seen any videos. I don't know if you posted in the last week. I've been, uh, well, busy is always a thing. Everybody's busy. Uh, but this week specifically, I got, you know, I did a lot of Zoom meetings and meetings are a little different for me. I'm, I'm used to phone calls, but these new meetings have been a little different. It's been a new thing, companies and us talking and people talking. So Nathan, Nathan says, uh, what does Nathan say? Nathan says, would I be able to paint over a matte white Kramer 84 with little or no problem? I want to make a Kramer 5150 and just want to make sure I try before. Yes. The only rules you want to follow are simple. It's, you got to figure out if it's polyurethane or lacquer. That's an easy thing to figure out. You can figure that out usually with a black light. If it glows, it's it's lacquer. Um, sometimes you can just touch it and find out. You know, just like rub on it. Lacquer will get gummy a little bit. Um, my guess, 84 Kramer, and again, that's a just a guess, man. Is it's polyurethane, something like that? I don't think they were using lacquer, but you need to check. The only thing you need to know is if it's lacquer, you got to put lacquer on top of it. If it's poly, you got to put poly on top of it. You can't mix the two or you shouldn't mix the two. As, uh, and again, I'm not a Finnish guy. These are just the things I hear Finnish guys tell me all the time. Don't do. So I'm just conveying that inform information that I hear over there. Um, maybe what I should do with these is sometimes I should 
bank up a bunch of these finish questions and then we get Nathan on. He can do it remote or he's, maybe if he's in town and we can just answer a bunch of finish things. Um, he's kind of like the finish guru that I know. Jeff says, I, I want to less Paul, but I, okay. I want to less Paul, want to love. I want a Les Paul, want to love my Les Paul. I buy, I play, I hate them, sell them at a loss, okay? What I hate, sticky neck, bridge digs into the hand, heavy, then quality issues, looking for a new satin one, Nashville bridge, IDs, mods. Okay, you, my friend, have come to the right place. I have the answer for you, and it is, uh, hopefully, hopefully, it's going to help you. I... um. I think you should get an Epiphone. <laughs> this, now, hear me out. Hear me out. An Epiphone is not just a affordable Les Paul. That's a lame thing to say. It, it's, it's true, but it's lame. An Epiphone is also the guitar for the someone that you, you, you just said. Think about what you're describing. You're describing an Epiphone. I want a Les Paul, but I don't want a gummy, sticky lacquer, right? So you can get the poly. You can find Epiphones with satin necks. Heck, at the price point Epiphones at, you can make that neck satin. That's a, you're right. Um, you can uh, throw in whatever pickups you want. You can make an Epiphone better than a Gibson. It's it's absolutely doable. And, and all of the things you're saying, the only thing you can't have, okay, so... First, I love the Epiphone bridge, okay? I like, they have a patent on it. It's a great bridge, okay? It, in my opinion, I don't know why that bridge, and I might be a little misinformed here because I haven't seen everything. I, I don't know why that bridge isn't being stuck on all the Gibsons, but but I haven't recently <laughs> compared the two, so it could be everything from spacing issues or whatever, but I like the design of the Epiphone bridge. Um, I like uh, the Epiphone finish because I like Polly. He says, uh, the other thing is... Um, the bridge digs in his hand. Great. And you can, you can change. That's something you can change. You can fix. You can take a file and smooth off the edge of the, the last, uh, the last, that's a real common thing I do for customers is, um, they have me round over and smooth over the, um, the saddle piece on the, uh, low E bridge saddle. So it's nice and it feels nice in your hand. There you go. Um, you can, what else can you do? You can mod it. <laughs> he says ideas, mods, give up. Don't give up. Buy an Epiphone. That's what I would do. If you don't like the branding of Epiphone, you can find the other brands that copy Gibson Epiphone and maybe do that. But I think I do Epiphone. I have an Epiphone downstairs I'm about to review. I'm very excited about it. I have a feeling I'm going to like it better than my Gibson. Could be totally wrong. I'm curious. But that's what I would do. Um, I would give up on the Les Pauls, the Gibson. It's okay not to like a, a Gibson. Uh I, I'll, I'll tell you, I love the way a Gibson Les Paul sounds. I've said that earlier in the show. I like the nostalgia of it. I like the collectability of it. It's like uh, my, my, my buddies, we all say park our money. I park. Look, the Gibsons you see behind me, I don't know how many are behind me right now. I think just two, right? Two. Those are what I call parked money. I park my money into this. There, I own I all my Gibsons right now. I, <laughs> I, could, I guarantee this. All of them are worth right now what I paid for them. What I paid for them. So I haven't, if I sell them all right now, I would not accept anything less than I paid. And and it, and from what I paid, almost every one of you guys, if I just said, hey, up for sale on that price, you would all buy it in a minute. So to me, it's parking money. It's like, I got a guitar. I get to play something iconic. It's kind of fun. And then in a couple of years, if I decide to let one go, I'll either make money or get all my money back. What a, fu what a fun thing to do, right? <laughs> um, you know, you can't get your, your, your interest in your savings accounts for crap sometimes. So uh, that being said, uh, I like every time I pick up headphones, I'm always a happier player. <laughs> so there you go. Kenneth says Epiphone was a really high end guitar until Gibson took it over. Yeah, but high end in price, the quality wise, I think they've really, really done a good, good job. John says, try an Epiphone 59 Les Paul. Yeah. The one I'm going to review is called the Muse. If you guys know, I like my Gibson light. Uh, Al John was on a live show. He was in the comments uh, a month ago and he mentioned, I didn't even see it, but one of you guys, thank you for echoing it. Somebody said, did you see Phil? Al John said the muse is like your Gibson light. Cause I was saying that I, I like the light, you know, but I would like to see an, a, you know, a Epiphone version. 
I have the Apple phone downstairs. I have not opened the box because I can't open it until I do the, I got to do the video in that order. You know, it's unboxing and then I, I diagnose the guitar. Then we demo the guitar and then I do summation. So I have to be ready for the filming when I open it. So hopefully I'll uh, open it this weekend. But I'm really, really curious. And that thing looks amazing in the specs of it. Okay. All right. <laughs> I was like, sometimes I forget. I don't get to read all of your comments back and forth. I got to I gotta stay focused. Okay. Uh, DP says, hey, Phil, do you think, by the way, I have to, hold on. Before I read your question, DP, hold on a second. The last super chat is uh, Brent. Okay, so Brent Horrocks, uh, that's the last super chat. So please don't super chat anymore because that's how I, that, you know, I got to do some non-super chats and back and forth and that'll play us out for the rest of the show. Um, so I appreciate you guys for doing that. DP says, hey, Phil, do you think anniversary inlays are cheesy? Okay, I have an 82 30th anniversary Les Paul gold top. I love the guitar. I hate the inlay. Was thinking of replacing it with a regular inlay. What do you think? Don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Uh, is it cheesy? Uh, I think when they come out, there's a little bit of cheesiness to it. Like, uh, you know, but I think then if you notice later years go by, it, it really helps date that guitar and kind of put it in its perspective of where it's, where it was in its life. You know what I mean? What year did it come out and stuff? So no, I don't think it's cheesy in the long term and I don't think you should remove it. You're just going to devalue the guitar. And I know I hate talking like that. Sometimes people are like, why do you guys always talk about value of guitars? Cause it's important. To 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 me in the idea that I need sometimes to get out of my my money back out of this thing. That's kind of how I think. I want to be able to enjoy something, and if I enjoy it for life, then I have it for life. I've had guitars that I've had for a long time, and I'll probably keep till the to the day I die. And I have some guitars that I enjoy, and one day, like I said, I might have to let it go. And if I let it go, I don't want to take a huge loss because I don't have to. In your case, I don't think I would replace it. I don't think I'd replace the 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 inlay. Um, it will not not bode well for the value of the guitar. If that makes you keep it for the long term, maybe that's a good investment, but I wouldn't do it. Um, but I don't think it's cheesy. How about that? I think, like I said, um, I mean, think of this. It's an 82. It's a, it's a classic. Isn't that funny? It's a 30th anniversary classic. Leave it alone. Very At the very least, I wouldn't sell it either. See, I'd love to tell you, like, sell it and get one without it. No, yours is cooler than a new one. Don't get rid of it. It's cooler. It's going to, so, and your money is parked well, <laughs> right? A 1982 Gibson Col uh, Les Paul Gold Top is a cool guitar and it's just going to get cooler and cooler and cooler. So Enrico says, I totally get the body and neck wood impacting tone, but is fretboard wood totally impactful or just feel BS to you? Um, fingers touch the frets, not the wood. Yes, that's true. Okay. Everyone's got an argument. Everybody like, Hey, the nut material doesn't, I heard this all the time, man. Nut material doesn't matter because unless you're on the open string yet, I've replaced so many nuts and so many guitars and I've seen it. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've heard it. What do I care? You know, we were talking about unbiased versus bias. You bring me a guitar and you have me change the nut from plastic to bone and then you know, you don't ask me if I, you know, you're not for approval. You just like get, get the guitar. I don't care. It's your guitar. It leaves, it leaves a shop. But I'm telling you, having no skin in that game, not being concerned or having to need to know or uh, having any value of it, I still go, man, it sounded better. Did it sound brighter? Sometimes I felt it got worse. I'm like, oh, just the, something went away. I think everything, like I said, I like this theory. Everything affects the tone of a guitar. I think that's the only logical way you can look at things. Now we could argue that a fretboard doesn't change the tone very much. In fact, maybe the human ear can't hear it, but it's it's got to have some impact because like I said, every little thing I've seen has some impact. Fretboards are actually where I think they come into place and how they make a guitar sound and how they can affect, I guess, how they can affect a guitar sound in theory is by how hard and dense they are. Uh, and an idea of the flex in the neck, there seems to be and, and again, in the guitars I've played over the years and how I've, I've perceived the sound of playing those guitars. There seems to be a little bit to how stiff a neck is, how rigid is it? How much does it flex and move? 
seems to change the way, obviously, the string moves, right? Think about it like a bridge, right? Post-tension bridge. Um, you know, I mean, you have a bridges that kind of move, right? And that that movement, uh, you know, is, is how they stay from falling apart. Same thing with a string. Your string's moving. And so the neck, the body, things can affect how that string moves and change it, I think. That's, that's how I feel. And I use the word feel because I love how somebody's going to tell me like, well, scientifically, I, I, great. <laughs> Again, great. And if I was all scientific here, I probably wouldn't be playing guitar. I'd be doing something else. I'm here because of the emotional aspect, aspect of music. I didn't listen to music and go, wow, mathematically, that, that, that chord progression makes sense. <laughs> no, right? Everything to me is emotional. And then I just want to figure out why I like what I like. Um, so back to your, your, uh, your point, do I think the fretboard has an impact of the feel? Yeah. Because I think if it's really stiff, like, especially like a piece of rich light, it's really hard. Yeah. I think it can make the neck feel a little stiffer, um, and change the way the neck feels. Although, you know, I don't know how much overall impact it has, but I think it's a smart thing to, I think it's always nice to be a little, little open-minded about it. I don't think I'm going to ever listen to somebody tell me, you know, like, oh, if you get this, this will definitely be this, you know, I'm not here to quantify anything, but I think there's always a little bit of that play in that, in that idea. I'm trying to also think about anything else I could kind of add to this. Um, I mean, obviously I just did a video where I had an aluminum neck and it was a carbon fiber fretboard and yeah, totally, you know, I didn't disagree with anybody who's like, some people are like, Oh, totally. It sounded different. Yeah, it did. There was things I liked about it. It was brighter snapped. The notes popped really, really articulate. I thought it was really, really good. I really enjoyed it. And again, had stainless steel frets and you can argue, well, if you put stainless steel frets on every guitar, shouldn't they be more articulate? They are, but they weren't as bright and as articulate as that neck. There was something about that neck that was nice and something about that neck that wasn't as nice because it wasn't as warm as uh, didn't have the, the, the low end mid range response that some other necks have. Mark, hold on. Just looking at time. Frame. Okay. Mark says uh, thoughts on using an audio file amp a la Jerry Garcia uh, with something like a synergy preamp are very different than guitar power amp sections. Yes. So, I don't know if that's a question there. <laughs> Thoughts on using an audiophile amp like uh, a la, like, like Garrett, Jerry Garcia with something like Synergy preamp. Are there, are they very different than guitar power amp sections? Okay. So I understand what you're saying now. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, because here's why guitar amps are basically designed off of old, you know, discontinued RCA pat, you know, patented products. I don't know how much different the guitar power section amplifier is from, let's say, any other two power section like audio files to me. And I'm not an audio file, so I'm not I'm not versed in this world. I do have friends that are audio files. Here's what I know about audio files. They spend an insane amount of money on some power amps and some some turntables and then an insane amount of money on some tubes, you know, old new old stock GE tubes. When I say insane, I mean, God bless them. But I mean, it's like, you know, it's a lot of money. It's not cheap to be in that that to be an audiophile. There's no cheap audiophile <laughs> that I've met out there. Um, I just don't know enough to know. The question I would have is not, is there, are, is it different? Is, is it better? Is you, is there something you gain from that? If you have a nice audiophile amp and you're thinking about throwing a synergy preamp in, do it. Remember, if it sounds good, it is good. So just, I would just do it. You would, you know, and, and if it sounds good, just stick with it. If it doesn't sound good, stop. If you're thinking about buying an expensive audio file amp and the idea of a quest for tone kind of thing, I would not waste your money. I'm, you're, you know, you could buy a nice power amp section and get that anywhere. So I don't think I'd go down that road if I was you. Uh, unplayed video games is the t sign on. It says, um, my OFR with OFR black noiseless springs. Feels stiffer than my Kaler. So original Floyd Rose. Okay, so your original Floyd Rose with uh, black noiseless springs feels stiffer than my Kaler. That would make sense to me. But the oh, original Floyd Rose stays in tune better. That also makes sense to me. Both 25 and a half inch scale, 10 NYXLs, um, standard tuning. How can I make the original Floyd Rose trim softer? Well, 
think about the kale. First of all, you got to understand there's a couple of things at play here. Just the angles in which the kaler works and the angle in which the springs work on the Floyd Rose are different. The springs on the Floyd Rose. Um, well, you already kind of say the black springs, you have the noiseless black springs, but I, when you say noiseless, I'm thinking you have like the FU tone springs. And I think the black ones are the short ones that are, they're designed to feel that way. So I would go with softer springs. You can adjust the two screws in the back and try to find that point where it does it. But I, I like, uh, I like using just the softer springs. I, I, again, I, I'd have to look on the color codes. You can unplayed video games. You can look it up on floydroseupgrades.com. In fact, if you go to that website, it might be yellow springs you're looking for, but the great thing is, uh, you could probably just ask them. Uh, I know it's funny. You just came here to ask me and I'm telling you to go somewhere else to ask them, but at least I'm sending you the right person. If you go to FU tone upgrades, Floyd Road upgrades and, and tell, and ask them to send them a message specifically saying, Hey, what Springs should I buy for my Floyd to give me the Kaler feel? I bet you they, they know. Um, and everything I would be doing would be a guess. I've never had anybody specifically ask me to get my, their Floyd to feel like a Kaler. To me, they're just different feeling tremolos to the Kalers are kind of got that loosey goosey feel. That's really cool. I like it. Um, but it's also the angle of the arm too. And how that feels in my, in my experience, the, the arms, just the positioning of it. Sometimes they're up here versus down here. It's a lot easier when they're up high, like on the Kalers, they stick up kind of like a, like an arm, like a tremolo arm sticking in the air. Metal fender guy. There's a metal fender guy. Metal fender guy who, okay, uh, says, what's the best way to go about soldering my three-way on my Dean ML uh, pond it and the Dimebucker wasn't working when I got it back seems hard to me. Um, okay, what's the best way to, to go about soldering the three-way switch? I don't even know how to answer that question. I guess the only thing I could tell you is... Um, with a soldering gun? <laughs> this is where you get really upset, right? The best way to do it. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll tell you. So I, I'll, I'll address it the way I think it makes sense to me. Uh, if you brought me a, a Dean ML and said that, you know, you need the dime bugger working, uh, I would open up and look at it. If within your case, if you don't know what you're looking at, the first thing you do is I'd pull up the schematic, which you can totally pull up on that guitar or any guitar like that. Just type in three way switch, you know, volume tone, right? Volume tone, tone, whatever the configuration is, humbucker, humbucker, type that into Google, a schematic come out, look at it. They're very, dude, it's really pain by numbers. I mean, we're, we're dealing in a world of basically schematics of just, it's made for the average person to understand very easily, all color coded and stuff. Look at it and then see where, where things have gone awry. It's a very, it's usually kind of presents itself pretty easily. And then just buy yourself a basic soldering iron and just go for it. That's what I would suggest to do. Super, super easy. Um, or you can take it in for service somewhere, but I personally, if you can take, do as much work to your guitar as you can. David says, I love the channel. What's my professional opinion on tone wood? Oh, okay. Well, now I'm going to get out the vodka. No, I'm just kidding. This is my, this is my water. I probably can hear that now, right? Water bottle. This is my water bo bottle. This is my new idea so that I have my, hey, my vintage, <laughs> your coffee cup uh, full of water. Okay, so. I think the uh, professional opinion on tone wood is stretching it with me a little bit, but that's okay. Does it affect the sound uh, in any profound way, given how much you can alter the sound by, by uh, volume and tone control? Thanks. Yes. Look, uh, and I, I don't want to kind of go back to what I just said a few minutes ago about everything kind of affects the tone to some degree, but let's, let's just argue with this. Everybody's argument has merit. That's why it's a nightmare of a discussion. It's not because somebody's wrong. That's partly somebody's argument is that there's a wrong party in this and a right party and they're I, I don't think they're on the right page. If somebody says, uh, I'm gonna throw an uh, throw a situation. Let's say somebody says mahogany has a warmer bassier sound than alder. And then somebody goes, oh, it has no effect and you can just get more bass by turning the bass control. Both those statements I think are accurate. Um, if somebody said to me, this guitar is really bright sounding because of the woods and I plug in an amp, I could probably warm it or darken the sound. However you want to say that using controls in the amps, EQing, all kinds of things, the pickups, changing out the pickups, everything is just a culmination of all the tones. I think the whole argument of tone wood in, in its 
when it started its origination, which was an argument before we're not talking about the argument, the reason it was used was people like the idea, especially builders, guitar builders of knowing, having a blueprint, who doesn't want a blueprint to the thing they make. They're like, how do I make a instrument that has a certain sound? And they go, okay, let's, let's figure this out. And they go, well, Alder body, maple neck, rosewood fretboard, humbucker, single coil, a brass bridge, right? This is going to give me a certain tone. They want a blueprint. But I think everybody who's ever made guitars can tell you this. Those blueprints, blueprints are generic guidelines that get you in the range. No one who's ever argued tone what I think is actually out there saying this is an absolute no one's saying at least, right? So nothing is an absolute. So to ask, to answer your question, uh, what's my opinion on it? Uh, I think it's, again, it's a good guideline. There's things that you can follow. You know, John Sir likes basswood with maple cap bodies. Eddie Van Halen did a maple, uh, maple cap on a basswood body and a maple neck. And he, he liked the way it, the tone is maybe that's true. <laughs> right. Um, what I will tell you is, is that I found guitars that have certain tone woods or woods in them and it has a certain tone and I've never felt that that was a quantifiable proof of anything. The other thing I will tell you is that when I custom build guitars, in other words, when I have a guitar custom built for me, I should say, um, I have never followed any kind of pattern of logic. The Kiesel I just had made, I told you guys I have a Kiesel coming, is a mahogany body, mahogany neck through and a hundred percent of the reason it is that combination of wood is because I knew a maple neck through would be heavier than a mahogany neck through body. Cause that would be one long hunk of, maho of maple. I have a maple fretboard on it. So I went mahogany neck, mahogany body and maple fretboard. And not, never once in my mind did I go, Oh, it's going to have a warm bassier mahogany tone. I think those woods may lean that tone a certain way, but I'll be able to fix it with whatever adjustments I can make to my amp, to my knobs, to my pickups. So, uh, I, I think tone would exist. I just don't think it's so huge that it can't be undone or corrected in some way. I think that's a, I hope that's a sane way of looking at this. I don't know. I still don't understand the whole people get triggered by this concept either direction. I don't know why anybody gets upset about any of this stuff. It's the weirdest thing to me. <laughs> and I find myself and I won't do it. I won't do it to you guys, but I found myself in sometimes personal discussions poking at people like, cause I don't, I don't think they understand how little I care about it. I have a theory on it. Like everybody, like, ah, here's what I think's happening, but I don't really invest my, my, my emotional state into tone wood. <laughs> <laughs> or the, right. Like I said, I like talking about it like you guys. So if somebody starts, if I notice they're getting a little triggered by it, I'll notice I'll just start changing my position on it. <laughs> Mostly just to see how twisted they could get, in the, right? To see how upset because I'm like, deep down, I'm like, why are they getting upset about this? It's just a guideline. Um, so and, and here's a good example. So B-Side Studio says, there is there a no tone wood? I don't know what that means. But uh, so uh, to the concept of uh, the concept of when somebody says there's no tone wood, let me tell you why um, I don't kind of lean that way. When somebody says tone woods mean do nothing. The problem is with that is that working on the guitars or building guitars or doing anything with guitars over the years, you all of a sudden hit some kind of wall. It happens to everybody. You can't get the sound to, get, to do something. And you find that exactly that. You know what I mean? Uh, like, here's a good example. I like Purple Heart. I think it's really cool. And every time I've ever ha either made something with Purple Heart or I've had something made with a lot of Purple Heart, I've not enjoyed the sound of the guitar. It's weird. And I'm like, well, it can't be just that. But it always happens to me. Just I think that wood is just too dense and it adds too much brightness to it. Um, so, and I will make as many things, uh, I will own as many guitars out of basswood as I possibly can. Cause I could give two craps once you put polyurethane over everything. <laughs> uh, mm. Sean Brooks. I like this. So we'll stay on the subject for a second. He says, tone woods do nothing equals then go play a guitar made of plywood and see how you like it. That's a, I guess that's my whole thing. Like I, I, I mean, players play guitars out of aluminum. They play guitars out of plastic. They play guitars out of car carbon fiber. Uh, you can play guitars out of anything and, and get a good sound. Um, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's just funny to me. I, like I said, I think it's fine. I recognize that I think there's 
there is something that is brought to the table by the type of wood you use in a guitar, whether not even the type of you know, like mahogany versus maple. Sometimes it's just the, you know, how dry the wood is versus how, you know, how wet it is, how dense it is. There's all these things that have factors, but I still think those are all so small that I just don't care about them. But it's not, it's not, I just, and I want to be clear. It's really that I don't care. It's not something that I value a whole lot for me personally, but it's not something I don't think it doesn't exist. I do think there's a variable there. Um, Yeah, and then B-Side said, uh, he's just saying he was kind of joking, but his point was, uh, all wood has tone, but 90% of his pickups. Pickups are a huge part of it. They are. But they're not all, like, I see, and that's why I like what B-Side's saying. I, I, B-Side, me and you, we could we could have a beer or a non-alcoholic beverage of your choice and have a conversation, because here's why. When somebody says to me, Phil, I think... 90% of the tone comes from this and, you know, and then 5% comes to the nut and less than 1%. You can't even hear tone wood. I'm like, yes. Okay, great. We can continue talking because I, it's not that I agree or disagree with that statement. I feel like, okay, we can con- conversate on about that a little bit. But when somebody's in absolute mode, like there is no this and there is no that, and there's definitely this, I don't know how to, other than if we just got hundred percent get along, I don't know how we're going to talk to each other. So three finger loose says tone wood equals money. The problem with that, and that's why I wanted to hit on this. One of the arguments I've seen presented on the internet, which I enjoy all the arguments. One of them was that the manufacturers are the evil tone wood uh, propagandists because they want you to believe that expensive wood has tone. I have been to 33 guitar factories, (laughs) That is not the conclusion I came to any of those factories. The conclusion I gave, gave, got is they actually, the manufacturers, even Paul Reed Smith, and he's probably one of the biggest outliers out there, out there in public telling you about Tonewood and how it matters. Even without him out there telling you Tonewood matters, the majority, the vast majority of what I see is they're really trying to get us to use less expensive woods in guitars. That's what they're all trying to use. They want to use less expensive woods and guitars. They want to get their costs down and their profit margins up. Wood is expensive, <laughs> period. And exotic wood is crazy expensive. Um, there's no, that's why, like I said, you, you're not, here's proof of that. Brazilian rosewood, you should Google it, how much it's worth per linear foot. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, it's insane. It's, I mean, literally insane. Whatever you're thinking right now, when you go, you find out you're going to you draw, jaw hits the floor. If, if it was all about money, somebody with a lot of that would just go buy this $38,000 guitar. So I think a lot of it is just, um, you know, so basically what I'm trying to get at is I don't think the manufacturers are really the tone wood, uh, propagandists for the most part. You know what I mean? They use terms a lot of times in marketing that's silly. <laughs> but I think the pickup guys do the same thing and everybody does it. I I think it's just a, how it works. Okay, we've talked about tone wood too long. <laughs> Let's go. Or maybe too little. I don't know depending on how you look at it. Um, okay, so the next one's from Robert. Robert says, uh, hey, Phil, you are my favorite guitarist on YouTube. You need to watch more YouTube, Robert, but I appreciate that compliment. No, I'm just kidding. I thank you for the compliment, but, but yes. Uh, it says, but I need some more metal, okay? Any chance uh, of you collaborating with Ola, uh, Kristen, Kristen Cole, or Keith Merrill? Um, I, you know, no. <laughs> the reality is, the reality of, of the YouTube world I've seen is it's usually the way it works is for a bigger channel, a bigger entity to work with a smaller channel, the the win is all on the small channel, okay? So a good example. So I, I hung out with Marty Schwartz. We did that video in 2019. We did a bunch of videos. He released them on his channel. Um, that's all win for me, no win for him, okay? That's just Marty's a cool guy. Michael is his manager. They're cool guys. We met in Nashville for a minute. Um, we had a great conversation. We did a video together. That video did well. They saw that me and Marty had a good chemistry of talking together and he, they thought what I do here on this channel would benefit some of his viewers and they had me come on his channel. 
the reason I say that is there, the benefit is always to the, to the smaller channel. In other words, Marty gets some views, but he can get views just by making a video. I'll get subscribers. I'm, I'm out of it. He won't get very many subscribers out of it. Just a few comparatively speaking. Right. The reason I say that is Ola England and, and bigger channels, th there's no value to them to do a, a collab with me. <laughs> It's basically what I'm trying to get at. So it it has to be a um and I'm not saying that they they you know that everybody's think thinks like that, but that's the reality of it. The benefit is all to me. So when you ask for when people like viewers go, hey, you should do a collaboration with this channel, that channel, sometimes you meet these people. You know what I mean? You meet people, I meet people. Um I did a collaboration with Music is Win on his channel, same thing. The benefit was all to me. But we did that collaboration because me and him had a beer, actually, believe it or not. That was actually true. We had a beer in Germany and we sat up in the hotel uh, lobby and we had a few beers and we had a good conversation. And from that conversation, we've had a few other conversations. And from those conversations, he was like, hey, why don't we do a video together? And then, you know, I mean, because it was a friend type thing. It was like, hey, why don't we do this? We like each other's personalities. And he's just like anybody who has a friend. He's like, Hey, I'll help McKnight out and get him some viewers. You know what I mean? Give him some subs. And so anytime you've seen me interact with a channel that's bigger than mine, it's always because I've met them externally outside of YouTube and we hit it off. And it was like, uh, Hey, Phil seemed like a decent guy. Let's get him on the channel. Cause they know what that means to a smaller channel. It's when I do videos, when smaller channels, the same thing, you know what I mean? It, it brings them some things, same thing. I met them off, off, you know, off the YouTube environment. So that's, that's my answer to your question. The answer is always easy. Would I do it? Of course. I know what the benefit to me is. If Ola in England and I did a video, I, I would benefit from it. Um, and, uh, and there you go. By the way, this is a nice segue <laughs> into uh, this concept or the conversation. I don't know if... I don't know uh, what you guys, you, you, you people on YouTube, you out there watching, get to see. YouTube has analytics and analytics on YouTube are kind of divvied to how big your subscription base gets. In other words, if you, if you guys have channels, some of you guys know this, like you got to get so many views and then so many hours watched and then you can monetize your channel and then you get, you know, and then I think you get, you know, the point where you can make custom thumbnails and then you get a thing where you get to do this. And then at some point you get a level, like you get your own personal assistant or not personal, but you get a person at YouTube you can physically talk to. Things happen as you go up the chain on YouTube, you get benefits added to you. One of the things that also happens to you is like I get um uh uh, I get auto reply, which means like when you guys make a comment on a video, if I want, I can say I can pick three one of three auto replies to respond to you. <laughs> I generally don't like to do it. It feels a little phony to me, so I can't do it. But deep down, I wanted to kind of do it because I'm like, oh, how easy would that be? Somebody's like, great video, fit all like and you and, and your responses are thank you or you know uh, you know great feedback or whatever, and then you pick one and it, it makes it look like I was commenting back to you guys. Um, that other thing that happens, so you know, that's on YouTube, that's really common. At, and again, I don't know what you guys see it, but I see it. It tells me what you guys are watching. I know what channels you're watching. All my subs. It tells me. It tells me exactly what you guys are watching besides me. So it lets me know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It lets me know all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of weird data it's keeping and it's showing me. So one of the things I can tell you is Ola England is in my top five uh, YouTubers that you guys watch. So out of all you, all the subscribers that watch my channel, uh, Ola England is the top five that you also watch. So, uh, so I said, I learned this stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, Tyler Larson's another one as well. You know what I mean? You get to see what channels you guys engage with a lot. Uh, Guitar Player Magazine's another one you guys engage with a lot. You you watch it a lot. Um, and so it says your viewers are watching this and your viewers are doing this. And it lets me know, um, and, uh, some of you guys are being funny. Uh, so uh, the reason I tell you that is um, is that a uh, uh, perfect example oh, that uh, validates what I'm saying. Ola would get nothing out of the deal because most of you are already watching Ola. <laughs> That's um, And I'm sure he's got analytics that say the same thing. So that's my fancy way of saying, of course, I would always do a collab with any big channel because it would just help my channel. It's a smart move for me. Um and I'm always open to do a, a, uh, Adam says it's creepy. It's not really creepy. It's really to help me. It's to help me. I mean, it could be, but it's really not so nefarious that it's tracking you guys in any other way. It's just tell me what help me finite, better make content. You know what I mean? It lets me know that if, uh, 
if obviously, you know, if you like other channels, I should pay attention to the other channels you like too, because maybe there's something that you like. So, uh, JHS is another one. He's in my top five, uh, channels that you guys watch, uh, along with me. So there you go. <laughs> That's your, my answer to your question. The answer is yes. I would love to do a, uh, a collab with them, but, uh, it would be all benefit to me at this point. Robert says two questions, two super chats. Any thoughts on the Fender LT 50? Should I have, wait, should I have waited until the Katana was back in stock? Any ideas for a good metal amp? Um, huh. I don't know the, uh, no, I like, look, I like the Fenders up there with the, um, the Katanas. So to answer your question, the core of your question is, should you wait it for the Katanas to get back in stock? Or, uh, no, I mean, no, I don't think, you, I don't think you're going to be like, man, I'm missing out. So no, that's good. That's the first part of your question. The second thing was, uh, any ideas for a good metal amp? Yeah, of course. 6505 mini head. I mean, I'm assuming you want, cause you're at practice, practice amp. I'm assuming you want some kind of nice practice metal amp. I don't know if you want a full size, you didn't say. Uh, LBX is fantastic. I love the angle. Uh, my Mesa Boogie Mark V. Hey, if you got the cash, if you got the, the scratch to check it out, definitely check out the Mesa Boogie Mark V Mini 25. I've had that amp. That amp, I feel I feel guilty if I don't promote that amp since it's the oldest uh, metal amp I have. I've had it since 2016, maybe 2015. Whenever it came out, I got it when it right when it came out. So 2016, 2015, I've had it that long. Literally, still use it still uh, right it, sometimes it goes out of rotation for a little time but it always comes back it's great so that's a great metal amp and of course the mt15 although like i said i would definitely look at getting that <laughs> that volume for the effects loop uh waterford giant is super chat for no reason with a big one of these one of these back at you i almost feel like the tone king one of those bad boys but i'll be like one of these okay so it says ben says i got the signature kyg les paul light in ebony <laughs> i appreciate the it says uh this week did you change this specified uh nines uh to tens uh not set up as well as my 2021 sp special so thank you ben for kind of implying it's this it's the gibson les paul signature film ignite or kyg guitar um so uh, i did i have 10 to 46s on mine uh from string joys on there um for no particular reason i think it was uh, you right i think it was 9 to 46 is what they shipped it with i just 10 to 46 worked for me so I put it on there. Um, I did not have to set mine up. So, so there you go. I didn't have any issues. And that was definitely not a, so, you know, I can tell you for sure that was not sent to me as a, let's make sure it's perfect for, you know, a, a, you know, a YouTuber channel. That's not how it came. So, uh, but yeah, I did a little bit of adjustment to mine m much, uh, just the bridge adjustment and then and 10 to 46 is, I changed it. Uh, Samir says, uh, hold on. How are we doing? Okay. We're doing good. Samir says, uh, I'm an elect, I'm an electric man. <laughs> okay. All right. You're an electric man. I'm just, I don't know why I'm laughing about that. I think it's cause I, I first, I'm like, is he trying to say he's an electrician? He's not, he's, he's an electric guitar player. Took me a second to figure out. He's, he's like, I'm an elect, I'm an electric man. I like electrics. But I need a acoustic to record close to pulling the trigger on a $120, $120 Korean Hummingbird knockoff. Thoughts on cheap acoustics. Acoustics are super, super easy. It's why the channels that do acoustics are never, you know, never huge channels. It's why the acoustic market is not as big as the electric market. There's not a lot of debate on acoustics. It works really simple. As generally speaking as possible, the, every dollar you spend on acoustic more, you're going to get a better acoustic. It is get better and better and better and better and better. That's easy. So to answer your question, my, what's my thoughts on that? It could be a great guitar, but I think if you buy a nicer one, it's going to be nicer. It really is that simple. You don't need a crazy expensive acoustic guitar, although it's going to be great. There's a reason why Martins and Taylors and Gibsons, you know what I mean? They, they are great. So to, that's what I would do. But for recording, sometimes it doesn't really matter. What really matters on your acoustic, especially for recording, good set of strings and your setup as best as possible. That's going to be be huge. Um, and a lot of times with acoustic for recording, 
how good it plays isn't really what factors in because you want the, the guitar, the strings to be a little high on the action because you're going to get a big boomy sound out of it. Better recording for a lot of, t- a lot of purposes, less buzz. So there you go. Um, I can tell you a trick I use uh, if it helps. Here's a little trick. I, I don't know where I learned it. I must have learned it from somebody because I don't think I was smart enough to come up, with, come up with it on my own. Because I play electric more than I play acoustic, like a lot of us, especially a lot of you watching, um, um, what I will tell you is when you record acoustic, the trick I learned is set the action not as high as you can tolerate because I don't know, I don't want you to get carried away, but make sure the action is a little not slammed because you want, again, the best sounding acoustic. But don't worry about how long it takes to get the sa- the the take right. So in other words, play, play a little bit, play a little bit, and you're like, okay, it's not working out, and then your hands get tired, stop. Come back tomorrow, the next day, right? In other words, don't worry about nailing it in one one sitting, one one session. Take a little bit more time. You will always see a big benefit from, you know what I mean, taking that time on the acoustic to get that acoustic in there right. Um and I, I've, and I've, I've really learned that over the years. It really has helped me tremendously, tremendously. Um, I play a little bit and I'm like, oh, I'm not nailing it. Or if I have to, I cut everything apart and piece it all together into one take. Just take the best from everything. Um, but the, um, that's, that's the best thing I can tell you. Um, because the acoustics are unforgiving in the recording of the performance. Every time you mess up, you hear it. It's really hard to it's really hard to hide that. My, uh, Mitchell saying my interview. I'm doing okay. We got we, like I said, we got to finish up these last couple ones. But thank you, Mitchell. The next one is Kappa 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 Shappa Shappa Shred. I swear to that's what it kind of says. Kappa 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 Shred says uh, about to invest in my first bass head. Should I go solid state or two? Both are mark bass. The price and feature are very similar. Can't decide. I, I play a solid state bass heads. That's what I play. Um, I, you know, I like two bass heads. And I, when I say I like, I mean, I used to play Ampegs forever and ever and ever. But I, I cannot tell you that, you know, I just, I, I can't tell you that I, I hear it anymore. I just don't. Not in the recordings. <laughs> so, in fact, like I said, I'm at to the point now where I'm pretty much bass amp lists on my bass. I'm just all preamps into into D, into recording, or I'm di into boards uh, at, at at playing. I just it's just how I go, and I I'm happy. EVTV, hey EVTV says uh, cheapest locking trim you would recommend. I want a beater with a Floyd Rose edge, etc just to make weird noises uh, with, but don't know what to, what, what you lose if you go, if you cheap out. I don't mind the setup if it's uh, stable. Um, yeah, I, I can tell you this, uh, when it comes to cheap Floyd Roses or those style bridges, I, I hear problems all the time. People tell me all the times they have these problems that the, the knife edges aren't very, the metal's not strong enough and they get dense and they don't stay in tune. I find if you set up the bridge right, the better ones take abuse a little better and the better ones stay more stable and a little easier. But I, I find it's not a big deal. The biggest issue I have with cheap Floyd Rose bridges for me personally is the arm is loose and no matter how much you tighten it, it's always loose. And there's two fixes for that. If you go Floyd Rose, you can go to companies like All Parts and literally just buy a German made trim arm and assembly, which has the the, the, the underpiece and then take you unscrew the old one out and put it in. That's going to feel a lot better. Or the oldest trick in the book is you take an ear plug, you know, like your, for your plug your ears, those cheap little foam ones, cut one of those in half and shove it down the hole of the Floyd Rose and put the uh, Floyd Rose arm in there and screw it down. And that makes it not wiggly. Um, and that's important because that wiggly, that little, not only does it sound horrible, but it, it's what makes the bridge feel really, really cheap and bad. That's what I would recommend you do. Um, I've seen people have me, well, I've had people have me lubricate the where the blades touch the posts and do all kinds of things to help and i've i've done anything people requested but me me personally it, it, like i said just been if you said you said you don't mind doing the setup just get a bridge and do a setup um there's certain ones i don't love as much and but it's usually all the weird knockoff cheap ones are a little problematic but i think anything that floyd rose does if it's floyd rose license even very cool for the most part and all the edge stuff cool Jeff Nelson says, thanks so much for all the great content. Love watching the channel. Thank you on that note. Hold on. 
we got Brent. Brent says, hey, Phil, is there a pedal you would recommend that would make a 68 Princeton reverb sound like a 57 Tweed Deluxe? <sighs> huh. I mean, I could say like there's 57 Tweed Deluxe type pedals out there for sure. But the print, the 68 Princeton has this weird compression and it's scooped. That's, you know, because I have that amp. It's, it's very scooped, which is what I like about it. The mids are just not very predominant. It's got a little chimey highs and a little thumpy low end and it's just kind of nice and it's and I, I just like it um the 57 tweed which i have a tweed deluxe uh, uh reissue but it's a 57 tweed deluxe is man it's more of a it's it should be scooped because it's the same kind of control out but it's just a different amp with more mids a little more barky so i don't specifically know what pedal i would use to get that to sound that way um, but I can tell you, besides all the you know typical 57 esque pedals out there, I would look at low, uh, you know, light overdrive pedals that have three band EQs, because that's where you're going to dial that in. You're going to dial it in by using EQ. That's mostly how you're going to get those amps to kind of how you're going to get the the Princeton to sound more like the 57 is by having a little bit more EQ EQ control to get it there. The the grit, the gain is just not going to be the biggest part. So there you go. All right. On that note, I do have to go. I have an interview in like 15 minutes that I have to do. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed hanging out this Friday. As always, I enjoyed it. And I guess I hope you have a great weekend. I'm pretty sure, uh, barring any any uh, mishaps, um, I don't know what video. There's a video that comes out on Sunday. And I just don't know because editing time, if it's going to be the Sharp and Max of the LTD that you watched the review of, or it's just going to be the review of the new Schecter I just did. Um I have both of them and they're both literally being edited at the same time and kind of pinging back and forth on those. So it's whatever, which one I get first done first. And then the other one will be the next one. So look forward to that. I hope you guys will look out for that. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button because you know, it will help melt snow if you're snowed in. And then on that note, thank you guys so much uh, for hanging out until next week. Know your gear. <laughs>